All right. So I'm going to move. Actually, I should have done this earlier. Move my mic. I don't mean for this to sound like a ASMR, but hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Can you hear me okay? That would be the question. So, I want to go ahead and line up this new article and we can discuss it. So I think there's a lot of misinformation about this concept and I wanted to just discuss it today. Um, I've got the little breathe in, breathe out GIF instead of my face uh, today just because I'm not having a great time. You can hear me but softly. Is this any better? Is this better? It's like right in front of my mouth so hopefully that's that's a little better. Um, yeah, I woke up with a migraine today, not feeling the best, um, but, you know, you just, you just get tired of your life being controlled by how much pain you're in, <laughs> and so I think that's why I just wanted to go ahead and power through this anyway, um, but I thought, you know what, let's just, you know, have a little animation or something in the corner for people that want something to look at, uh, that moves, because I'm not, I, you know, I don't have to go through all of that extra pain of, you know, getting ready and then having to sit here with the lights on and stuff. So hopefully that is a, an acceptable response. I also feel like I'm on the radio, <laughs> so that's kind of fun. Normally we have a face accompanying it, but yeah, I feel like I'm just some, I don't know, some college DJ in the middle of the night or something trying to help you guys with your studying. <laughs> All right, so this was, could have a clown animated, I could have, but I, I like this one, um, I think it's really good, it's, it's, uh, I don't know, if you're feeling just stressed out, I think that's a good one to have, all right, so this was posted pretty recently, um, I guess, well, recently in, in my head, it's been a month, but... I saw it um, on Twitter, and instead of reading what it actually said, a lot of people had responded to it, just like reading the title. They had responded to the title. Um, I sound so close, it sounds nicer somehow. Okay, well then that's good. Lee SMR, that's that's good, good. I don't know, I feel it feels more pleasant to actually to talk this way, so I'm not yelling or talking so loudly, so this feels, it feels good. Maybe we'll do this in the future. So, yeah, so it had this, this link was shown on Twitter. And again, instead of re actually responding to it um, by reading what it was, and it's actually not, not a long article at all. Um, it's, it's quite short, you know, there's some images and stuff, and then that's it, right? It looks like there's more to it, but it actually stops here, and the rest of this is just, you know, advertisements. So it's actually quite short, um, but instead of just reading it, people did what they do, where they had m interpreted the title, and then from there, they ended up um, responding to what they believed the interpretation of the title meant. Um, I thought this was going to be fat but fit in general, thoughts about it, but it's specifically about heart stuff then. No, no, it's just what uh, we're going to start off with, sort of what inspired this. Um, it's something that I wanted to do, and I wasn't actually sure if I should even do it as a live stream, um, but I decided to go ahead and do it as a live stream first. So with this, the, you know, we'll talk about this, we'll talk about what the BMI is, we'll talk about the health at every size and body positivity movement, we'll talk about the diagnosis fat um, hashtag as well. So that's what we'll do. And anything that you want to talk about fat and fit in general, you know, feel free to do that. Um, so this is just where you can ask some questions and hopefully get some answers. So when it's talking about fitness here, it's not talking about your ability to run, how flexible you are, or how physically strong you are. There was this idea that was pushed, um, sort of in conjunction with Hayes, which is health at every size, 
Um, but not, not entirely, but it was basically, listen, you know, doctors have this, uh, a buddy of mine's a doctor and he says, one of the problems is that when you're dealing with a patient, you have to figure out how you want to approach it. Um, yes. Hello, Max. It did just start. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if I saw your, your vent on the discord, uh, but you can post about it here. You can copy paste clips of it if you'd like. Um, so a buddy of mine was saying that he has to figure out which approach he wants to take. There is the scientifically supported approach, but then there's also what will my patient feasibly do? And that's when it becomes difficult for doctors. They know what to tell you so you can be in optimal health for your genetics, for your ability, um, for your situation. But they also know that a lot of people are resistant to doing something like that. So instead of telling your patient, okay, you have to lose 120 pounds, they might say, well, you know, what do you, what do you normally eat? Or like, what do you normally snack on? And they'll say something like, well, you know, I snack on uh, candy, for example. Okay, well, you can change that candy to fruit. If you drink soda, you can change it to diet soda. Um, you know, and try to go for a walk more. And that's something that a lot of doctors will start off with. Has anybody experienced that? I'm going to take a sip of my coffee. My mouth is quite dry, sorry. Oh, being tested positive. That does not sound good, Ratsa. I definitely like the voice, benefit from a pop filter, but... Okay, well, I'm glad you guys are liking that. Doctors catch hell for talking about obesity, okay? This is a hard topic because people are very sensitive about this ever since the fat acceptance movement and body positivity stuff came out, especially women not trying to be sexist, right? And I, I think that it is something to say about women, um, typically in a society that is more um, patriarchal, um, because there are matriarchal societies and it doesn't actually apply as much as you would think. But in societies that are patriarchal, historically and even currently, um, they have been uh, prescribing what they feel a woman, a woman's body should look like. And so they've been prescribing a lot of their own um, personal feelings or their own um, biases and stuff, you know, about what the perfect woman should look like and uh, the perfect measurements and the perfect height and all of that stuff. And so to hear somebody else, and again, your doctor, just depending on where you are, probably going to be male. Um, that doctor is going to tell you, hey, so your body, again, doesn't match up. You're to this, to that. You've heard that all your life growing up female in this society. And now you have another person saying you're not measuring up again. And that's where, um, I, like I said, I, I don't think it's it's sexist to say that. Um, because I think it's it's just, you just get tired of it. <laughs> you just get tired of it, you know. Um, let's see, I actually had a doctor judging me slightly for my weight with my Achilles tendonitis, uh, but when I got, uh, but I got it when I was in the best shape of my life. Yeah, and we'll, we'll talk about that as well, about, um, about that diagnosis fat. And so this is a, it's a hashtag, um, that I think is, is definitely worth talking about, uh, for this topic. So anyway, that's, that's what doctors have been saying that basically, you know, yeah, you're obese, but instead of focusing so much on weight loss, why don't you try to get active? And it was this idea that that's something that's a little easier for a lot of people to do. It's easier to move more than it is to, um, to adjust your diet. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, some of them are, are emotional, some of them are psychological. Um, but it's easier for people to feel, okay, you know, I can, I can move more. Um, just as I guess a quick show of hands, quote unquote, um, how many of you have been obese? We're talking about medically obese based on the BMI chart. So how many of you have fit in that category? So 
Summer says, it's difficult when I was gaining weight and obese. My doctor was patronizing and wrong about much of what he said. His bias helped him miss what I had developed, uh, that I had developed Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Yes. And I, and that's why I said we will definitely talk about um, the role that doctors play in this. Um, Ratza says, I've never been obese, but I was definitely close at one time. Okay. For me, I was about BMI 40, 41. That was my highest. And I'm just curious about anybody, anybody else. It looks like Summer mentioned being obese. So when you're in that situation, not morbidly, but probably obese right now. See, and that's that's another thing about that, um, the problem talking about this. There's a lot of um, almost preemptive defensiveness with that. We We feel like we have to quantify our obesity. Um, and a lot of times people will say stuff, well, I'm, I might be carrying a few extra pounds, but I'm not like sloppy, you know, or I'm not like one of those gross people that lies around all day. I actually move around and have a job. And so we always feel like we have to quantify that. But I, I would ask, I would ask us, us to ask ourselves why we do that why I feel like I need to explain my situation. What am I justifying and why am I justifying it? Nobody asked me to justify it. You know, we have, if you think about like Judge Judy, you know, they, she'll ask a question and instead of just saying yes or no, the person will try to explain why they're eventually going to answer yes or no. And she's like, nope, I just want a yes or no answer. Um, so it is pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I have been clinically obese, five foot seven, two fifty five. Summer, I feel like you and I are like almost the same person sometimes. <laughs> so we are the same height. I was heavier um, than you, but yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, let's see, never obese, but if the lockdown was to last five years more, I would definitely be obese by then. Okay, yeah. And so when we're talking obesity, that's why I said medically obese. We're talking the BMI. Um, there are some people that they will they will honestly believe they're not obese because for them obese carries with it a lot of stereotypes and they feel like they don't fit into those stereotypes so they feel like okay so therefore i'm not obese but obese is a medical definition it's it's like it's like your height it's it's a number right um so it's not about um it's it's not it's not a subjective thing so it's an objective thing. That's why I was saying that. That's why I use the word obese and not fat or how many people um, have felt fat or anything like that. Okay, overweight, but not currently obese according to the BMI. Yeah, Summer, it is really crazy, isn't it? Uh, I started my current job with a BMI of just over 29, so technically not obese, but not really much different. Right. Yeah, you're definitely right on that cusp. And we'll talk about the BMI as well and what it actually what it actually means. So when you're at that weight, every time you are told to lose weight, you tell yourself a bunch of reasons why you can't. And that's why I said we should, um, you know, we should always be a little bit introspective about that, about why we, we get defensive about it, you know. And I remember I had um, gained some weight, not uh, definitely not like significant like into the morbid you know into the obesity kind of thing uh back there but i had uh you know i would say pushed into um overweight bmi and i had done that um after a death in the family and it was my grieving process unfortunately was to binge eat and anytime somebody brought up my weight or a, some clothes didn't fit the way that they had fit before. That wasn't a reminder of, hey, you need to lose weight. Or, hey, you're putting on some weight. You know, time to stop your, you know, stop what you're doing. You don't want to be obese again. Um, instead, it was a reminder of the death. And that's what I think is hard. That's why it is easy to lose weight in terms of we know how to do it. But it's difficult to lose weight because we have to figure out why the person is doing the overeating. And that's where it becomes an issue. 
So that's where the doctors have had this issue, this problem of, I want my patient to be as healthy as possible, but what is possible, right? What is physically possible might not be what is realistically possible for the patient at this time. And so this idea that doctors had was to promote activity because people overeat for a lot of reasons. Activity is a little bit easier to sneak in as a lifestyle change, you know. Um, Hey, you're driving to the store anyway to pick up your binge food, you know, in my case. Um, You park at the end of the um, park at the end of the parking lot as far away from the entrance as possible. That's a way to sneak in some extra walking. Okay, cool. You know, do a lap around the store first before you figure out what you want to buy. So don't put anything in your cart, look around and then get a cart and then, you know, start loading it up. That's another way to sneak in some exercise, right? If you're sitting there watching TV or cooking something in the microwave or what have you, you can do some leg lifts. You can have a couple, um, you know, weights at the, you know, under your couch, you know, and pick them up and, and use them while you're waiting. There's a lot of ways to sneak in extra exercise. And so that's why doctors were pushing this concept of, well, at least that's better than being just obese. But it turns out they were wrong. And that's where this study comes in. And so we're just going to go ahead and check the live stream. Um, Good evening, Obyung. I don't have a set of scales, okay? Um, It shouldn't matter to judge, but more an indicator to say something isn't right. If this is a less judgmental approach was taken, I think it could help, right? Just checked 29.98 as on the cusp as you can possibly be. Yeah, I would say, uh, yeah, especially if we want to round up, right? Uh, It's costly too, that's true. People can be insensitive about their remarks about people they find overweight, which is probably why people are sensitive on the topic. Yeah, I would agree. And again, I think that's why I say we are preemptively defensive. Um, And that comes from having been attacked in the past. Um, So this is the right approach. Well, that's, that's the hope, right? But it turns out it's not true. So that's what this study was, was talking about. And when I saw people responding to it on Twitter, they were saying stuff like, obviously this is wrong because sumo wrestlers are fit. Um, strong men are fit. These are people that do a lot of weightlifting. Um, I mean, I guess we can just look at a picture like Magnus for Magnuson. Is that what it is? Magnuson? I can't, I don't know. There he is. Um, So strongmen are, um, they are strength competitors, so they don't focus on what their physique looks like. So it's not like bodybuilding. Bodybuilding is about, is about um, sculpting a physique and getting your um, body fat as low as possible. So your musculature shows as well as possible. Um, It's about uh, balance and unless you're a mass monster, but um, it's about balance and aesthetics and stuff. Um, for the strongmen, this is about just being physically strong. And of course, you know, some of these guys are pulling trucks. So nobody would ever look at this person and say, oh, somebody like Magnus or Magnuson, he's not fit. But that's not what they're talking about with this. And I knew that because the BBC had already reported the same thing about three or four years prior. And so I just want to double check, is it the same thing? And it was. And the fitness they're talking about is what the doctors had hoped to avoid or to help. That maybe if I can encourage my patient that's obese to exercise more, maybe that would offset some of the problems that come with obesity. Maybe that would offset the increased rate of cancer or the increased rate of stroke, the increased rate of heart disease. And that was the hope, was that if my patient is not going to change their diet enough to lose weight, at least with increased exercise, they can at least be healthier, if not healthy. And that's why this is a big deal. We found out that's not true. 
fat on your body, that excess fatty tissue is not this inert thing that's just there in existence. For those of us that have been very obese, we know it impedes your movement. So for me, I had lost a significant amount of weight. Let me, um, sorry, let me pull up my calculator on my phone real quick. Um, so I lost about, um, 54 and a half kilograms. Okay. It's about 120 pounds. Imagine waking up wearing a vest, like a weighted vest of 120 pounds or 54.5 kilos. And everything you do is with that vest. Can you imagine that? Going up a flight of stairs, trying to walk to the grocery store, just lifting yourself out of bed or bending over at the waist to tie your shoes. Everything that you do is automatically going to be more difficult, right? Especially if you have pre-existing conditions of joint issues like arthritis. But then on top of that, excess body fat produces estrogen. And unfortunately, estrogen puts us at risk for certain things like cancer. Um, don't worry, testosterone, um, you don't get off scot-free. Unfortunately, that puts you at risk for heart disease. Okay. So let's go ahead and read this real quick. See what you guys are saying here. Uh, the BMI is a great way to look at a national average. I think the more you start getting into fitness, um, you start understanding that. Yep. And remember, we'll talk about what the BMI is for. Um, but yeah. However, I understand from a fit person's perspective, it's kind of frustrating when people are hating on you for being healthy and yet they refuse to eat healthily and exercise themselves. I agree, Max. Um, there is actually, there was a person, um, a couple people have made that remark to me that they have only seen me the way that I am currently. And so when I was trying to offer them some help because they were talking about, you know, oh, it's so difficult to lose weight. And gosh, I, you know, I've, I feel like I've tried everything and I just feel so stuck. They were just kind of complaining, you know what I mean? Venting just as one does. And I said, well, you know, um, what are you doing now? And there's some ways to, to do this and just trying to figure out what they, you know, what their current state is so we can make these modifications and hopefully help them reach their goals. And I've had a couple people actually say, well, you don't get what it's like, you know, your genetics have made you naturally skinny. And I just was like, first of all, girl, I ain't skinny. But second of all, you do not know my past and, and you don't know that I was larger than you in some cases, you know, when people have said that. Um, I used to walk with a cane and I did have a customer when I was working at a supplement company um, tell me that people like you don't know what it's like. And I said, people like me, which type of people like me? People like me working three jobs at one time, but still going to the gym six days a week. People like me that are physically disabled, but still exercising. Or people like me that used to weigh more than you, but managed to lose weight and keep it off for, for about 10, I guess it was 10 or 15 years at that time. Or no, I guess, what was it? Five or six years at that time, I think. And I said, so which people like me? And they just left. They just left. They they hadn't. Their face was totally had shut down, like just totally blank. Um, it was the the strangest response. Um, but just this idea that they were immediately deflecting anything that was coming at them. Um, you know, being healthy is something you do all the time. And I've heard people say stuff like, "Well, why would you go to the gym? You know, you seem to go to the gym a lot, or you seem to exercise all the time." Um, you eat so healthily, you know, why do you do that? It's okay to eat this thing like this pizza or whatever. Um, you know, you're already, um, you're, you're not fat. You're already slim or however they want to phrase it. And I say, yeah, that's why. Like <laughs> they don't seem to understand that it is an, it is a daily thing. And having been so obese, unfortunately, people that are um, that level of obesity and higher, when they lose weight, it damages their, um, their metabolism long-term. So long-term, um, I have to consume fewer calories than somebody that's my height and weight that never was obese. 
So somebody that's my height and weight might be able to eat 1800 or 2000 calories a day. And that's what's going to maintain their weight. Um, but for my doctor, he says, you need to stay um, around 1400. Um, so for me, I have to watch what I eat all the time. And so is it annoying? Sure. Is it more annoying than living obese? No. And so you have to figure out which one you want to live with. That's the annoying thing. Uh, people who are overweight or obese clinically, um, they can be upset by being in that category. They can, but again, that's where we want to, when we have these negative emotions, we want to analyze them. And sometimes the negative emotion is very obvious, right? It has an obvious um, uh, cause, you know. I had mentioned a death in the family. Obviously, I'm not going to feel good about that, you know, right after that happens and even still later. But if somebody hears you are obese and then they feel bad about it, they need to analyze why. And then how did I get into this situation? Do I feel it's worth it to get out of this situation? And that's why um, I think that it's a good idea. It's, it's a good idea to, to analyze your feelings, I would say. Um, I know walking for five minutes, if I can do five minutes several times a day, it's better than not moving at all. Start moving, make small, sustainable changes. They become reflexive and habit over time. That's true. Just to be clear, I only get frustrated with people who can control their weight. People who can't help it don't deserve to be held to the same scrutiny. Now, we do have to be careful with that, Max. There is no medical condition that will make you gain weight for calories not consumed. And that's what I think people don't understand. Can your metabolism change? Absolutely. I just said that mine had. That means I can't eat more than that on a daily basis, or else I gain weight. That's all that means. My metabolism still exists. It still does what its function is, but it does that with less food or fewer calories these days. I can think it's unfair and it sucks, but I know that I can't just overeat and then get mad that I gained weight. That's my fault. And so for people who can't help it, I think the, the only category we can talk about perhaps would be children because um, they don't know better and also um, people with um, prader willi syndrome. So that is a, a totally different thing. And again, that is insanely rare. <clears throat> um, of course, those people can still lose weight. Um, it's just it takes an outside force. So they won't be able to lose weight in and of themselves, like at, as they exist by themselves, right? So they are not necessarily responsible, but that doesn't mean their body doesn't function the same way. Uh, one thing that has been cool is to see Eddie Hall and Hafthor Bjornsson losing all their strongman power stores uh, for a boxing match. Yeah, definitely. Uh, my daughter's BMI is 52.2 or 54.28 right now. That is unfortunate. That's got to be hard to see, especially since you were, you know, in a, in, in the obesity category as well, you know, to see that. And that's, for me, it is hard. It is hard for me to see, um, you know, younger people and people that I care about. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Obyung, I probably missed it. Do you have a clear definition of fit for this discussion? Um, Josh, no, 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 Josh, no, <laughs> don't say there's no clear definition and that it means different things to different people that no, we, we already talked about that. Maybe you joined us late. Um, fit in this case means at a reducing your risk for heart disease, cancer, and stroke based on excess body fat. So Obyung, what this meant here, this, just this title what this meant was that the belief that doctors had that encouraging physical activity for their obese patients would somehow offset the health risks that obesity had them um, at risk for, that's not true. So you can be obese, exercise regularly, and be at the same risk for heart disease, stroke, and cancer as a person that's your same obesity that doesn't exercise. That's what fitness is here. 
Okay, so so we have to be careful. This what we're talking about is not a subjective, uh, you know, kind of nebulous concept. This is specifically what we're talking about. That's what this subject is. Uh, that's what the um, study was about. Okay. I used to be chubby when I was a little kid. Started break dancing the weight shed it off. Well, that's good. I went from 255 to 95. I would choose 95 over 255 every time. I would agree. Obviously, 95 is not going to be healthy either. And I think that's where people um, kind of mistake it, you know, that, well, you know, I, I'd rather be, I know I used to say I'd rather be overweight than underweight when I was, um, when I was obese. But the fact of the matter is, even though you're weak, for both cases, right? You're at a bunch of health risks for both cases. At least you can find clothes that kind of fit you, right? At least it's easier to move. At least you're not putting extra pressure on your joints. So for those reasons, it is easier. When you sit down in a bench, you don't spill over and onto somebody else. So those are some of the, the reasons. Um, let's see, being out of shape, even without the fat, um, makes life more difficult. Right, right. And again, we'll talk about that as well, just about health. Um, let's see. I've also heard people tell me the only reason I was successful in my shape is because I'm male. Um, even though some studies can show that men shed off fat faster, that's not true for every male. Right. And so testosterone, you know, that's helpful. Um, but that's not going to somehow, you know, it's not like the Catholic confessional of weight loss, right? Where you're just like, I'm going to not make any changes and then go to my testosterone and then everything's magically okay after I do a few Hale Arnold's or something, you know, um, you're still going to have to do the life changes. You're still going to have to make them a permanent change, so on and so forth. Yeah. Let's see. Zensei says I was 220, 230, uh, and around 2016, my worst, I was 175. Now your quality of life is negatively, reflect negatively affected when you're heavy, unquestionably. And that's, yeah, that's definitely the case. And again, that's, uh, we will mention that as well. So are there any questions about this, what that fat but fifth myth is? Do you guys, are we good with that? So all this is saying is that if you're obese, and you're active, you are still at the same risk for all the obesity health issues as if you were not active. That your activity level does not negate your risks for cancer, heart disease, or stroke that come with being obese. So do we have that? We're good. Yeah, the, I forget how it goes. Hale Arnold, whose arms are heavy, vascular be thy veins, 10... Sets be done with something, something, uh, with something like, but let, let lunges be done, 10 reps, something, something to add girth as it is to strengthen. Give us this day our daily protein and forgive us our fats as we forgive those who eat fat too. And lead us not into, um, catabolism, um, but deliver us from, uh, I forget how that goes. Uh, for thine is the strength physique and power forever amen or something like that that's how it goes so strong men already increases yes yes isn't that nuts so that that idea that the doctors had now is it now does that mean that being physically active as an obese person has no benefits no right if you're physically active you're going to be building muscle that's going to help you through your day, right? If your back is really sore and it's hurting, um, building up your back muscles, that's going to reduce that pain, okay? It's not without benefit. It's just that would be better if you had lost more of the weight and had continued the exercise. Um, shaman and bodybuilders often live pretty unhealthy lifestyles. They, they definitely do. Bodybuilders have their own unique unhealthiness about it. Um, people of girth. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, we're, I don't know who God saw it is, but, uh, we're going to be just focusing on just like the medical definition. 
Uh, I was fatter than the average Korean before college and drinking during college I'm even fatter. Started going to Itaewon to shop for clothes. Uh, for those that don't know, Itaewon is the um, like a foreigner enclave. Uh, it's like a foreigner district in uh, in Korea, in Seoul. And so what Obyung means is that there, I think Obyung when you were here, when you were growing up, um, it was similar to how it was when I first moved here, but that has since changed. So the obesity rate in Korea has been climbing for sure. And you can buy um, larger clothes in a lot of stores these days. But in the past, if you wanted to buy something that was larger than the average, you had to go to special stores. And so that's why Obyung's talking about going to Itaewon. All right, I'm gonna drink some coffee again. Cool. So the BMI, what is that, right? Does anybody have a definition for the BMI they want to share? Like if you had to explain it to, uh, I don't know, a 10 year old or 12 year old or something. body mass index a mathematical concept okay but if it's a mathematical concept then why do we use it at the doctor's office children don't understand they do you just gotta explain it the right way they'll get it I've explained menstruation to kids younger than 10 they get it just gotta explain it the right way <clears throat> ratio between height and weight okay so why do we care about that why do we use it at the doctor's office Also, I'd like to thank all my online classes and military service for making me feel comfortable sitting in silence. <laughs> I don't know if you guys are comfortable with it. Increased health risk with increased weight, weight, weight by height. That's right. That does not mean that, for example, um, ratio is skewed towards the height or the weight part you most likely have excess weight that is true they they do find that it actually underestimates um not overestimates what do we got magnus for magnuson um so this is uh a popular um fat acceptance um spokesperson i guess we can call this person and her argument is that, well, you know, the BMI doesn't make any sense. It says that, you know, I'm at risk for blah, 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 blah. But you know what? I'm healthy. My blood work is fine. My um, blood pressure is fine. So on and so forth. Cool. That's not what the BMI is for. The BMI is about health risk. That if you continue to maintain this level of excess fatty tissue you are likely to encounter the following problems. That's all it is. It's like with smoking. The more cigarettes you smoke per day, you are more likely to encounter something like lung cancer. Does that mean 100% of the people will have lung cancer? No. Does that mean that you can't get lung cancer as long as you're a non-smoker? No. Does that mean... You have lung cancer right now just because you smoke two packs a day. No. It just means if you continue to maintain this level of cigarette smoking per day, you are at an increased risk for lung cancer in so many years. That's what that means. Let's see. For optimal bodily functioning, proportionate height and weight. Okay. Lee, please. I was eating... I'm sorry if this had 
triggered you to stop eating. Sometimes that happens. Uh, Tess Holiday, I remember when she was the fat, the face of fat acceptance when I was in college. Yeah. The other problem with men lose weight easier um, is that having extra weight increases, not only increases estrogen, but that comes at the cost of your testosterone uh, because test is a precursor, right? Uh, right. It's causing damage over time. Exactly. Uh, 50% of my patients who smoke have died of lung cancer. That is a statistical significance, right? So again, that doesn't mean that you're going to die today. It doesn't mean that you're going to have heart problems right this second. Okay. The body is really good at adapting, but it also breaks down over time. What I see when I see somebody like Tess Holiday, I, I don't know why. I don't know if any, if this is just what other people think too, but I see her skeleton. Like I almost like see it imposed over the image almost like an, I don't know, or like an x-ray or something. And I just, I remember just my aching back and my aching feet. You know what I mean? That's what I see. I, I like, I, I have like those, those pain memories come back. And I, I just think about, she's got the same skeleton. You know what I mean? Over time, that's going to wear down. That's going to break down. And that's, that's that's a thing again that comes with a like wear and tear like chronic wear and tear right just like you could pick up a heavy box right now and maybe be fine but the more that you do that if that becomes like your job right and you're doing this for a long time you're going to have joint pain you're going to have back issues you're going to hurt your back eventually um, even though you're lifting with your legs by the way also, women use it as an excuse to not lose weight and blame it on their gender, which is not empowering to women at all. Right. I would agree with that. Um, like her bones pulled apart and shifted by the fat. It's like saying my pulse um, is 100. Smoking is fine. I'm healthy. I breathe fine. Right. Right. And so that's what the BMI is. Now, the BMI actually is not just a one size fits all. There is actually an Asian BMI. I wasn't, I don't know if you guys were aware of this. Where was that at? I think I've had it here on this tab. So the Asian BMI, this is an average because places like, I think Singapore actually puts um, obesity at 26 instead of 28. So why is it changed like this? Because on average, Asian people tend to store fat in their abdomen. And that stomach fat, that belly fat, is more metabolically damaging. That means that at a lower BMI, that's when Asian people typically notice those health risks. So the cancer, the diabetes, the, the heart disease starts at a lower BMI than for non-Asians. They are considering um, making one also for Africans and Pacific Islanders because they tend to keep their fat a little bit lower which tends to be more, um, again, it's, it's metabolically safer, but not safe. It's like the difference between smoking two packs a day and smoking one and a half packs a day. Um, let's see, sweaty hat man. Most fat people know they're fat. Oh, okay. I, I don't know, uh, what that was a response to. Um, let's see, just looked it up in general, a person with a BMI of 25 to 29.9 is considered overweight, while the person is, uh, with BMI over 30 is considered obese, right. But what is that, you know, what does that actually mean? And so that's, um, what it means is that when you hit that BMI of 30 and over, that's when your, um, health risks are going to significantly increase. Um, let's see, one of my best, uh, what do you think of fasting? Um, I mean, evolutionarily, right? We evolved with fasting. Um, I think the research on it is very interesting, but I will say that if you, if you know that you are prone to an eating disorder, probably best to avoid it for the time being. Yeah. Uh, one of my best friends pointed out an interesting fact, just because someone isn't gaining weight doesn't mean poor health decisions aren't harming them. Right. And again, we're going to talk about what is health, um, because... The, the only difference between an unhealthy fat person and an unhealthy not fat person is that you can see on their skin 
what's going on, right? You can see that they're at risk. But for a person that has a lot of visceral fat, we call it skinny fat, um, that kind of person is at that, that increased risk as well. Um, so that's why it's, it's important uh, to, to have overall health, which again, what we will talk about. Uh, Pulse, Pulse OX is my oxygen saturation 100 is perfect. Thank you. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't thinking for OX for the oxygen. Uh, is excess loose skin an issue with BMI? I would say it's more of an issue with um, how you carry your fat. But yeah, I have loose skin for sure. Um, I actually had some of it surgically removed. Yeah, it was, it was that much of an issue for me. Eating bad, not sleeping, drinking too much alcohol does harm people. Even if they're young, too many people think young people get away with anything. And that's true. Again, some of these things are like chronic issues. If you are a younger person, like you're 20, 21, 25, and you decide to down, you know, 10 shots of some alcohol, that might not kill you. But if you do that every day or more, more, uh, multiple times a week, for several years, that's that wear and tear that's going to affect you. That's why it catches up with you when you get older. Hail Arnold, full of way, this will be with thee. Blessed art thou amongst brothers and blessed are gains. I have our Lord of Roden. I love it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't, I think my oxygen, I'm trying to think of the, I don't remember the last time I got it checked, but it was, whatever it was, it was not alarming at least, yeah. Holy Arnold, father of lifters, pray for our swolsters now and at the time of our PRs, way men. I love it. Fat around the midsection tends to be worse over time than fat in the thighs and butt. Yes. And so that's why they are considering um, changing or adding an additional um, BMI group for people that are um, African and Pacific Islanders. I think the problem comes with people that are mixed, like myself, um, you know, being mixed, it's like, which one do I default to? But then just myself, just how I am, I'm just like, okay, we'll just go for the one that's like the more extreme or the more um, uh, restrictive or something. That's just kind of how my, that, you know, it's like when I was training for um, like the military stuff, you know, it, it was, there was like recommendations of what you should do and how fast you should go and whatever. And I thought, okay, well, if I have to run this amount in this time, then I'd better make sure that I can run it even faster just in case, you know, like just in case I wake up that day and I'm not feeling good or something, I'm feeling tired, sluggish, whatever. Um, I should be able to safely slow down and still be able to meet that. So for me, that's just kind of my, my thinking. So that's what the BMI is. Okay. Again, the BMI is talking about health risks due to excess body fat or being underweight. That's what it's talking about. So what is health? <laughs> How would you define health? Also, I am still wondering for sweaty hat man if you could respond to that when you commented most fat people know they're fat what was that in response to because we had commented earlier um about this concept of like being preemptively defensive and so i'm wondering if you had just joined us and just had um been concerned about that is it the number on the green bar in the corner um i'm not sure what you mean is what the number I am nodding, school noodles rattling. I tend to choose extremes as well. Oh my goodness, we are um, we are a bit laggy. That's okay. Don't worry. Health is health. Thank you, Ratsa. That's great. It's like some of my students' answers. <laughs> And government is governing. Oh, okay. Well, congratulations. And when they give me those answers, I'm like, that's, that's great. You know, that, wow, profound. You know what, what am I even doing here? You should be the teacher. I mean, with that, that kind of, that kind of answer, my goodness. And they kind of just laugh, you know, because they, they give those answers because they're just, 
they're just being lazy you know they know they know what it is they just don't want to type it out they don't want to speak it out you know oh health is the green bar okay <laughs> uh this is for again for singapore um and asian bmi but that's that's not what health is so this in this case um all that means is that if you're this weight so when we're talking about the healthy bmi yeah, you shouldn't try to troll me when my brain is not 100 percent exactly healthy bmi or healthy weight all this means is simply um we'll put an equal sign here uh your current weight is not a risk factor for certain obesity related or underweight related illnesses that's all that means a healthy weight doesn't mean you're healthy it just means you're at the neutral or i guess uh, baseline um, risk for heart disease for people of your sex that live in your region something like that because there are environmental factors and again we did mention testosterone being a factor for heart disease BMI under 25 is good. The ideal BMI, bottom of ideal BMI is better and best to lose a few extra pounds for good measure. Yeah, tell me about it, Summer. They say that our politicians are running the government, but if they knew the speed our government moves, they wouldn't call it running more like standing idly. That's, that's true, I would say, but I'm not sure what that is in response to, Chris. My current weight is the same as when I was a freshman in college. I was fat, as I said, but does maintaining weight for a long time mean anything? That's a great question, Obiang. That means that the, um, we talked about there's like the wear and tear, right? It's sort of like if you are, let's say that your car has some kind of alignment problem. It's not going to cause you to be in a car accident today, but the more that you drive it, um, the more uneven wear you're going to get. And you're going to get some um, problems with that in the future. Um, it's It sort of would be like neglecting to clean or I'm trying to think of another another type of analogy. It's hard to find analogies for the body sometimes because uh, it's we're a little bit we're a little bit different. Um, think about using now that now I'm sure I'm trying to think about gears and not uh, properly lubricating them but that tends to to seize up the the machine pretty quickly um but yeah what we're talking about is that over time wear think about it like you if you didn't sleep well for one day it sucks but you know you get over it but if you're chronically not sleeping well that's going to affect your um, immune system that's going to affect your ability to function in society so it's that wear and tear that chronic maintenance that is um so what's happening in your body right now is it's already having to work harder just to make you live at your current weight and when you're having to do that every day working at more we can say that the baseline would be 100 or baseline would be 1 or 100%, your body is working at more than 100%. You cannot maintain that. You just can't. Over time, it's going to affect your liver. It's going to affect your heart. It's going to affect your um, your blood vessels. Um, those kinds of things. Yeah. I'm sorry, what was the Asian graph? I missed it. Oh, we were talking about um, the BMI and just how that's uh, that's different depending on different ethnic groups. That's that's all we were talking about. Were you here for that? If not, we can just do a quick recap of it. Um, health is minimizing irregularities in the systems of your body. Ooh, I like that. Um, risk has been found to be higher at lower BMI and Asians, right? Like changing your oil, maybe? Yeah, okay, changing your oil. I think that's good. Um, Cause you're still getting that lubrication in there for the for the, the engine. But yeah, if you don't change the oil, eventually, yeah, you can, if it's what, change your oil every 3000 miles or something, that's the, that's the phrasing. Um, 
yeah, you can go to 4,000, you can go to 5,000, you can go to 6,000, but if you just keep driving your car without changing the oil, it's going to affect performance for sure. Uh, the freshman 15 is a myth. Um, I lost 31 pounds my freshman year. It's all about taking initiative, staying on top of things, a healthy tool for academic success too. So the freshman 15, I don't know if I would say it's a myth so much as it is um, correlation, not causation. Um, the freshman 15 usually is just due to, I guess, in a lot of families. I don't know. It wasn't this way with me. Like I grew up and like had to start cooking when I was like young. Um, I guess the, so the freshman 15 is, I, I guess, in families where your parents make sure you have food all the time. Uh, when you're now on your own, you're like, yeah, number one, I don't know how to cook. Number two, uh, I don't have a big oven or nothing. So I'm just going to make ramen and order pizza all the time. So yeah, you do gain weight, but it's not because, you know, it's not because you're older. It's not because it's just because you're overeating. You know, it's the same when people say birth control um, makes them gain weight. There's no, no evidence whatsoever for that. Um, however, again, it's that correlation where people who usually start taking birth control usually are at that age where they're also starting college or they're starting to live on their own. And again, that's where that, um, taking your own, uh, you know, having to cook your own meals, not knowing how, feeling like you don't have enough time. Um, and you just kind of default to this like pizza and ramen diet, um, with a lot, usually, you know there are people in college in that age, you know, they are drinking more alcohol as well. Um, and then just those increased calories, it's just at the same time, you know, you're also taking birth control. And so instead of saying, wow, my diet sucks and my alcohol consumption is, you know, off the charts and I'm also gaining weight. Well, I guess it's best to change that. They instead blame the birth control, which is also related to that health thing. We, I did want to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me. I have chronic extreme insomnia. It's tearing me apart. Docs used to say it wasn't dangerous. They changed their tune when I was in my 40s. Yikes. What kind of doctor would say that? I don't know how to put it pro properly, but health is much more than weight. Infections, inflammations, weird stuff, lifestyle. Uh, when kids go on campus, it's basically an all-you-can-eat buffet. Yep. Um, so many people eat fast food every day. That's going to come back and bite them later on for sure. I heard you mentioned testosterone and heart health. Um, what is the correlation? So unfortunately, um, testosterone does put you at an increased risk of heart disease. Um, estrogen puts you at an increased risk for cancer. So <laughs> thanks, evolution. <laughs> um, but that's that's the case. Also for men, by the way, or I guess um, uh, people who are male, um, if you are finding that you have erectile dysfunction and you and it's not psychological, um, go get your heart checked out. Yeah. It's usually the first sign of heart disease. <clears throat> um, I frequently go without any sleep for days at a time for way over a year. I haven't been able to get more sleep than one to one and a half hours. Yikes. Summer, that just sounds like hell. This is kind of like when you sue fast food restaurants for getting type two diabetes when they eat fast foods every day. Right. I think that there is something to say about the idea of like, mcdonald's sponsoring the olympics where people will think okay if this olympic athlete can do it then i guess i can eat it too um maybe that can get it you know give it sort of a, a misunderstanding but i don't think anybody i mean how could you really look at deep fried food like french fries and chicken nuggets and say oh yes this is this is right there this is my athletic uh, you know, a meal here. Being manly breaks our hearts. Oh my God. Rats. Uh, how do we give rats an F for the day? <laughs> so anyway, to go, to go on with health. Yes. I, I really liked, um, I really liked how that was put by, uh, Zensei about minimizing the irregularities, irregularities in the systems of your body. And I would also say that would include mental health as well. So your health is not just one thing. And that's where I think a lot of it becomes a problem. When we talk about advertising and when we talk about the diet industry, um, I don't think that those things in and of themselves are necessarily bad or necessarily toxic or anything like that. 
But it's the idea that there's one thing that I can change and then be better, right? And be more healthy or more happy or more this and more that. That's where the problem comes in. You know, oh, sugar, that's the cause of this. No, it's the fact that you eat too much of it, right? Um, again, with the 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 correlation uh, between birth control and gaining weight, really, you the person should look through all of this stuff that they're doing and say, my goodness, I need to make a serious change to my lifestyle. This is negatively affecting my health. And instead, they hear somebody say, Oh, yeah, I heard that birth control makes you gain weight. Oh, it's the birth control. That's the problem, right? Because we really like this idea of I just have to change just one thing. But this one neat trick or this one um, easy change or this one addition to my day. And really, it's not. It's not. I think any of us that have had to make these changes, you know, you, you have to change, right? You have to quit smoking and quit drinking and, you know, work on yourself and, and how to deal with, um, you know, your, your mood issues and why you have these, you know, why certain things can just trigger you to be super angry out of nowhere. And, you know, well, what am I doing in terms of, you know, my physical fitness? Am I walking more? Am I do- There's so much to do and it's worth it. But I think it's, it's, not good to set people up for this idea that it's it's just one change it's making a lot of changes and you don't have to make them all at once but to lie to somebody and say all you have to do is just stop eating carbs and then you're going to be healthy no not at all that's that's not no (laughs) um So have you heard about how skinny fat people are less healthy? No, actually. So skinny fat people, they are at the same risk for obesity. um, Or not obesity, sorry. They're at the same risk for um, like heart disease and stuff as uh, the people that are active but obese. They are at risk for heart disease, cancer, stroke in the same way that inactive or skinny fat people are. So they're not like more um, unhealthy. They're as unhealthy as an obese person. Yeah. Because again, it's not based necessarily on size. But of course, the size is a factor. It's like an indicator, right? If you're physically larger, that means you have more excess fatty tissue. Um, But having that uh, abdominal fat, that visceral fat, that definitely um, is more of like a, a... metabolically damaging that's what we were talking about earlier i think it was before you came in um and that's why the asian bmi is different because on average asian people tend to put more weight on their stomach area and so that's why they start experiencing those obesity related illnesses at a lower bmi um yikes that's not good i'll mention the heart disease um erectile dysfunction thing to my pcp uh, it's probably connected to my antidepressants, though. You know what? But just get it checked out. Yeah. You know? Just get it checked out. Uh, I don't understand. Fast food doesn't even taste good. I think for, for some people, um, it does. You know? I think for some people, it's comforting. I will say that there are people that come to Korea and they'll lose weight because some of the Korean food is so different from what they're used to eating. Um but there are people that will like come to a place like Korea or somewhere else and they'll move somewhere else. Um, and that fast food that is pretty consistent across the world, that becomes like a comfort for them. You know, um, I'll tell you if it's, I always have to talk myself out of getting Taco Bell. It's not that I love Taco Bell. It's just, it's so rare in Korea. When I see a Taco Bell, I'm like, Oh, I got to stop here. It's like, a taste of home. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Wait, no, I don't even like Taco Bell that much. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> so it's, you know, it's, it's like, sometimes I'll buy it. And I was like, what did I, why, why did I buy this? And I'll just look at it. I'm like, I don't even want to eat this, you know? Um, so for it's food is, is definitely more than just sustenance for, for most people. Yeah. 
On the bright side, improving your physical health also improves other aspects of your life, like mental health, healthy relationships. So the effort for hard work is worth it. I, I would be very careful with that. Um, it can improve your mental health in some way. But I mean, if you've got clinical depression as an obese person, you're going to have clinical depression once you lose the weight. Like it's just not, it, you, it's, it's a brain thing. Um, some of the triggers for your depression will go away. You know, like if you looked at yourself in the mirror and you hated your size, that triggered more depressive episodes. Yeah, that trigger's gone. But and in that way, it's improved. Um, but you're definitely still like you got depression, <laughs> you know. Um, they are only more unhealthy in comparison to others, their weight. OK. Um, I once read that the expectancy of obese people is the lowest or life expectancy of obese people is the lowest. Um, however, overweight people have the highest life expectancy. Yeah. So Obi that's a really good question or comment. Um, so that had come out and people were wondering why did that happen? And they were so confused by it. What ended up happening again, this was a correlation, not causation thing. Um, once they had kind of controlled for some other factors like, um, you know, a person who's a, a, in, in a healthy weight range that drinks too much versus a person in an overweight health range that doesn't drink alcohol at all. You know, once they controlled for those things. Um, it just, it turned out that overweight people tend to see the doctor more often anyway. So if there's a problem, their doctor tends to spot it earlier, addresses it and is able to prolong that person's life expectancy where a person that's a healthy weight, even if they are unhealthy, but their BMI is just that they're not at these other weight risks or their um, health risks because of their weight. They're like, oh, I'm fine. I'm healthy. I'm not going to see the doctor. And then because they never got any of these um, early warning signs checked out, they end up not getting them treated and they can drop dead from a heart attack um, without ever realizing that they were at risk for heart disease at all. And so that's where that problem, that's what had happened was that the overweight people were already going to the doctor more frequently. And so they were able to catch that earlier. Yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. Um, sugar is pretty huge. Honestly, I lost hundreds of pounds and drastically cutting sugar was a huge reason. That's, that's great, right? But I'm saying that the number one, sugar is not necessary, right? So it's easy to just cut that out of your diet. We're like fat, protein, you definitely need that stuff. Fiber, you definitely need that. Um, so that's one thing you can just cut out of your diet for sure. What I am saying is that simply cutting out sugar is not going to magically make you healthy. So just cutting out sugar doesn't mean that your other food choices are healthy choices, right? So if you have, let's say, a really poor diet, um, nutritionally poor diet, and you decide to cut out sugar, that doesn't mean that you're now replacing that with anything um, healthy, right? So you, you might say like, there's some people that will do something like keto and they will replace the sugar with some kind of, um, overly salted, um, like meat, like preserved meat product, for example, that's not going to make you healthy, right? You don't, you don't need all of that, uh, extra saturated fat. You don't need all of that extra sodium. Um, and especially if you had replaced it somehow uh, equivalently, like with the 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 calories, um, you're not going to see a huge, huge loss difference there, too. Um, it's also not going to help you with your mental health just by cutting out sugar. It's not going to improve your physical activity just by cutting out sugar. So that's what I was meaning. Can cutting out sugar lead to some great changes with weight loss? Sure. But... What I was saying is that health is not a single thing, right? You cut out sugar and hopefully made other changes to your diet and hopefully um, got more physically active and hopefully uh, dealt with like mental health issues and hopefully, you know, quit drinking and hopefully quit smoking and all of those other things, right? Because if you maintained all of those other bad activities in terms of like bad health activities um, and you had cut out sugar then you're not healthy, right? You're just at a healthier weight, but you're not healthy. 
Uh, I like Korean Japanese pizza. Never had it, but I've seen the horror stories keep the corn off the pizza. Yeah, that's that's something. That that's probably one of the biggest complaints. Um, when I first came to Korea, they they do have just pepperoni now, um, but that didn't exist when I came here. Um, and the pizza is really, you know, you, you're used to getting like a five dollar pizza, like pepperoni pizza. You can't get something like that here. Uh, but yeah, corn, potatoes, mayonnaise. It says bacon, but it's not. It's more like wet ham. I don't know. Not a good time. Um, let's see. Same Terrell went on keto. Wait, just evaporated. Never felt bad with it. Right. And again, it's it's not like I. I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot and it's not, not helping. So maybe a healthy weight just means you're not at an increased risk for certain things where excess fatty tissue is a factor. Being a healthy weight does not mean you are healthy. So I, I would, I would almost want to change that term. That healthy weight range should be more like baseline weight range. So we'll, we, you know, that's not the term, but we'll, we'll use that for the rest of this video. Baseline, again, uh, we're just calling it that just because we're going to be at a position where it's not adding, um, your weight in and of itself does not increase certain, um, health issues or health risks. That's all. And also you have to be healthy, right? <laughs> That's, that's the other thing. Yeah. I've heard of Swedish pizza with peas on it. I've heard of Swedish pizza with bananas on it. Let's see. Um, I think it's easy to go nuts with sugar because it's easily drinkable in soft drinks and juice. Basically a lot of snacks. That's true. Um, I still think a journey to a healthier life is fulfilling, even if it's ext extremely difficult. I would agree with you. I would agree with you. Um, the problem... The only problem with it, I would say, is just laying it out for somebody who's already hesitant to start, right? When you tell them, they're like, okay, so, you know, that's easy. I can just start going to the gym for 30 minutes, three times a week. And I'm like, okay, that's a, that's a start, <laughs> you know, but here's a laundry list of other things you need to do. That's very overwhelming for them. Yeah. Um, I consider three avenues of mental health and that is body chemistry, trauma, and thought patterns. Okay. Um, keto is great. I lost so much weight with it, but it made me realize I really love my carbs like rice, fruit, and beans. Okay. Uh, Ratza went on keto and started running. Um, fixing my food intake only would have helped me with how much I move at work, but not as fast with exercise. Right. I think salt is only bad when you mix it with carbs and don't get enough potassium. There's a lot of talk about it in the salt fix. Yeah, and I think it also has to do um, with how much like sweating, like physical activity that you're also doing. Risk reduction weight. Ooh, I like that. What could we call that? Risk. Yeah, maybe just risk reduction weight. Double R. We don't talk about banana pizza. It's nearly as atrocious as pineapple. Ratsy, you just collected a bunch of Fs today, aren't you? Uh, that, let's see, that is just eliminating that, that risk, right? So that's that baseline of risk reduction. Exactly. So good. We, we have that, right? So health is, is a, is a totally like health is a lifestyle. And even then, you know, there are those of us that somebody would look at us and never necessarily consider us a healthy specimen because we have chronic um, pain or chronic health problems or something like that, right? You're just doing what you can with what you have just doing your best with that um korean life expectancy is around 85 now on average people are sick for 10 years or the healthcare system has really extended it but being sick for 10 years uh yeah that's that's pretty intense um and i i'm gonna wonder how i mean i think the healthcare system is definitely definitely a big factor for that um i'm not sure how many of the like extreme obese um, and just like quite obese, uh, people that are now, um, getting more and more, I think, popularity on YouTube. Um, there's like plus size models and stuff in Korea now. So that's definitely becoming a, it's, it's, it's growing. You know, I've had students that are larger than me. Like if I tried their clothes on, I would never be able to fit their clothes, you know. 
Um, my deal was the whole package. I went on keto, started running. Calisthenics really works. Also won $75. Yeah, I remember you telling me about that uh, weight loss challenge with your coworkers. It's pretty cool. All right. So that being said, um, you know, we do want to talk about the health at every size kind of situation. Okay. And um, this person is not like a medical professional, but I don't know if you guys had heard of, um, I think the way you pronounce her, that name is Reagan. Um, so this person was uh, pretty big in the um, fat acceptance and haze community. Haze means health at every size. So I just want to touch on the FAQs um, and just kind of weigh in on them to, you know, no pun intended. So isn't being fat unhealthy? And the person says, no, weight and health are two separate things. Um, there's healthy and unhealthy people of all sizes. Right. It is multidimensional, um, not entirely within our control and not a barometer of worthiness. And this is when I kind of go back to back when I was, um, you know, in church playing on the worship team when I was a teenager, having a talk with my um, worship leader. He had told me he had grown up Mormon or something, joined Mormonism. And I said, how could you have done that? You know, you're such a strong, like Christian quote unquote, but that's like our, that was our, our, you know, Christian cult, whatever. And he said, well, you know, they always bring you in with a piece of truth. So that way it's easier to sneak in the lie. And that's what this is here. It is true. It's not always entirely within our control. For those of you that are um, regular viewers and also um, were with me on the Discord chat this morning, I wasn't really, you know, I was having to push through making this uh, because of the migraine. That's why we don't have a picture of me or a video of me um, today. Um, that's not entirely within my control, right? I can take all my medication. I can... Um, you know, wake up and not oversleep and not undersleep and not do this and not do that and change this and change that. And I still get migraines. I mean, there's migraines that I get for hormonal fluctuations. There's migraines that I get um, because of my lymph nodes. They're, they're swollen right now and the doctors aren't sure why. Um, there's migraines I get because of the weather. I, I, can't, I can't control that. Weight is not one of those. There is, unfortunately, a myth that got put out and people really wanted to believe it, that your weight is not under your control. Now, are some people naturally slim or have an easier time putting on muscle mass or something? Yes, sure. Of course, genetics have variation, but your genetics are not going to make it so that you are within like a BMI 50. You know what I mean? How, how will your genetics create fat on your body for calories not consumed? Remember, fat is excess that it's being stored. If you're not consuming excess, how, where does it come from? Right? So this is the, this is the problem there. And again, when we're talking about health, I, I, I think that the BMI should change that healthy weight to, to either that baseline or that risk reduction kind of rate weight, um, because I think that does confuse some people. Isn't health at every size just giving up? And they say health at every size is a choice to focus on healthy habits as a path to health rather than focusing on manipulating size as a path to health. And so this is a false dichotomy, right? As some of you have stated, and as I've lived through, you can focus on healthy habits to reduce your body size. And you also focus on healthy habits as a path to other health, right? You want to reduce your body size um, to not only reduce that added risk um, to those obesity-related health issues, but also just to make your life a little bit easier, right? I mean, imagine... Where are you going to buy clothes that fit? That's extra money to be spent because you're paying for extra fabric. That is, um, you know, you might find that it's very easy for some places to run out of your size because they only carry a few 
of those. You have to buy everything online. You have to wait for it to come in. Um, it's harder for you to bend over and tie your shoes. I mean, it, this is not like, you know, a single, a single thing here. We don't have to choose. You can do both. You can do both at the same time, right? Now this one says here, um, we'll start here. Um, studies on long-term dieting show the vast majority of people regain their weight after five years, oftentimes regaining more weight than they lost. That's true. But if you actually look at the studies, it's because the people that did dieting did dieting short-term and then they were studied long-term. So they weren't doing long-term dieting. They were long-term studies on temporary dieting. In other words, if I go on a crash diet, like the cabbage soup diet for 20 days, am I going to lose weight? Absolutely. But is it sustainable? No. And because I learned nothing about changing my diet in a positive way, I'm going to simply go back to eating how I used to eat. And no surprise if I was obese eating a certain way and I returned to eating that way after I lost weight, I'm going to be obese again. That's why they not only regain it, but they usually gain even more. Okay. For the people that there is a long-term diet, um, like long-term weight loss um, tracker. So it's a government um, thing, at least it is in the United States, where they track people that they have to meet the criteria of they lost something like more than 50 pounds of weight and have kept it off for at least a year. And they just, it's like, what are you doing to maintain this? Pretty much everybody is saying, count my calories. So they made a permanent change. That's it. This is why, because most people think dieting is temporary. It's temporary to reach a goal, but that goal doesn't, I, I don't know how anybody could think that they can go back to their old method of eating, but somehow prevent the weight gain. That doesn't make any sense. So it says dieting here, they add dieting does not meet the criteria for evidence-based healthcare. What I think they're guessing, or what I think they're getting at here, is that simply, you know, going on the cabbage soup crash diet does not meet the criteria for evidence-based healthcare. Sure. I would agree with that. But again, they don't, they don't explain it that way. Right. And again, we're not talking about dieting. So this whole thing is just a really big, you know, it's a straw man and it's, it's not explained very well. If you go on a crash diet, you will lose weight. And then when you stop the crash diet and you go back to eating how you're gonna, you ate before, you will regain weight, sure. If you change your eating habits to be healthy and sustainable, you will lose weight and not regain it. And that's also evidence-based healthcare. So let's see. Um, health at every size does involve giving up on some things, including the hope of getting societal approval that comes with being thin. So just like being within that risk restrictive or risk reductive sorry, um, baseline BMI doesn't mean that you're healthy. Getting thin doesn't mean that you're going to have societal approval, right? I think everything that you do, somebody's going to have a problem with it. Let's go ahead and go back up to see what you guys are saying. All right. Uh, what counts as plus size in Korea? Just curious. Yeah, we can actually check it out. I would say that's also plus fi plus size in um, Western countries, right? So that would be plus size. These are plus size models. And again, you know, you can see this um, like big, you know, roll of fat. I would say a large stomach that's being pinched in by um, by that that skirt. So, I mean, this is, this is not like, oh, we're looking at someone that's, you know, would be within a, a w you know, baseline BMI for the Western or non-Asian um, criteria. Like, no, they would still be considered obese, 
you know what I mean? Um, we can see, you know, here you can see the stomach, the extra like fat on the triceps, that kind of, I mean, this person would still be obese according to the, the BMI, uh, the, the non-Asian BMI. Let's see, um, our Korean plus size model is the same size as normal weight, Western model. So we want to get rid of that normal weight. Um, normally when we, we talk about using the, the adjective normal in terms of humans, um, the, the argument is always against, well, is it, it you know, it's abnormal, right? Um, but in this case, normal weight would be average weight. It is the weight that is the norm. The weight that is the norm in a place like the United States is obese, right? Or it's at least overweight. Um, so we would be looking at the average weight of Western models or something like that. Um, but no, that's that's not what it is. Um, it is a... I, I would say it is... Just as Angelina Jolie does not represent the European woman, like the European um, genetics, right, um, in terms of body size, the people that you see doing K-pop do not represent the rest of the population here. On average, you know, it's Koreans can have like a slimmer physique, possibly, right? But they're they're not like they're they're not fat magicians. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like they can't magic away fat. You know they they are the obesity rate is growing here for the same reason um, as anywhere else. Lack of activity, increased access to calories that are inexpensive. You know it's the same thing. Um, what we see in terms of like models, I mean, would you ever think that Kate Moss? represents the you know all british women right in terms of body size no and in the same way you can't look at like i don't know black pink what is that because i don't know a lot of k-pop so we can't look at these k-pop groups and say oh yes this represents the average right we can't we can't do that um these are people who are paid to have a certain physique and they are horribly scrutinized by the public um, when they gain a little bit of weight so this is not the average by any means yeah um, so plus size is plus size you know it's it's obese bmi yeah um starving yourself really sucks too um i mean i don't think anybody was saying it doesn't uh wh what was that in reference to oh okay sorry I see. I missed dual flame. The only way you can lose weight faster is if you starve yourself. That's true, but again, is that sustainable? Right. <laughs> so it's not, not sustainable. Um, see you later, Chris. Hobble at extreme size. Okay. My 600 pound life is shocking by design, but it causes them to think they're not bad. They're not that bad, despite being 250 to 550. Exactly. You know, I think a, a great example is Amberlynn Reed. Um, she's very insistent that her highest weight is uh, something, I don't know, 564.8 or something like that, right? She's very specific about it. She doesn't want to hit that 600 pounds. Like to, to a lot of um, very obese people, the 600 pound mark, it, it's like, it's like the end, right? It, it's like this, this really bad, place to be they're already in a bad place <laughs> you know what i mean that's that's the problem you, if you're 400 pounds you're already in a bad place you don't need to get to 600 pounds to say wow i've really let myself go you are already in a bad place yeah i went to the gallery yesterday saw plus size models on posters um looks like fat acceptance one in that case i think it depends i mean what do we want models for right um I think plus size models should exist for sure because if you know one of the problems I had when I was obese was whenever I looked at a product for um, people that like the product would come in my size 
I wanted to know how it looked because I saw how it looked on the standard size model, but I knew that's not how it would fit me, you know? And so that's one thing that I, I, I think, yeah, the, the public, you know, it is, I, I would say it's a smart business choice, right? Um, we can, you know, if you want to go into moral stuff, I mean, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about, but it's a smart business choice for sure. You know, and the purpose of a model is to display the clothes. So a person who's purchasing the clothes or potentially purchasing the clothes has an idea of, oh, this is kind of how it will look on my body, which is for the same reason I'm in favor of different body shapes, right? So there's a lot of, they say like straight like up and down kind of look. That's a that's a lanky look. Um, that's how a lot of models are are typically. Um, that body is is what's typically favored. Um, if we have very pear shaped, you know. So if I see something, there's a lot of times I, I'm too scared to buy the product because I know that it might look great on those slim hips and those slim thighs, but I don't know how it's going to look on my body. And because they didn't provide a model that has that body shape. I, I, I just, I'm too scared to buy a lot of stuff, you know, I don't want to buy it and then have to send it back and all that other stuff, you know, um, it's just, it's just too annoying. So I just don't buy it. Uh, the fact that they said worthiness tells you what they're really talking about. They're trying to cover their own feelings of inadequacy by blinding themselves to their own health problems. And I, I would agree, you know, I was in that boat as well. Um, you know, I used to tell myself things that, it was just to make me feel better about my weight because I didn't want to talk about my weight, you know. Um, oh, it says, if you don't believe in Christianity, why discuss the Bible paradigm so much? I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm, I'm not sure what you're talking about, Hiram. Um, I was talking about a, like a, a mentor and I had a discussion with my mentor. Um, that's what I was talking about. Uh, genetic excuses for severe obesity, a lot of times, I believe, are created by corrupt bullies. I mean, I would say when I... Believing that your your obesity is unfixable, I mean, that... Who who wants to hear that, you know? So yeah, I would say maybe it is, it is a bullying type of thing. Um, bending over to tie your shoes without breathing heavy dog okay do you mean like the downward dog the bending over to tie your shoes without breathing heavy dog um let's see um where do we lose yeah also that header photo is dumb being able to do the splits isn't a marker for health right but the the idea that the person was trying to get was look at me you know i i can do this thing that they say fat people can't do you know um not changing lifestyle leads to not sustaining loss right i did dieting got into a bad place mentally stopped the diet got into bad old habits 100 percent on me regardless of my mental state right diets are a months to years thing no so diet i mean just like strictly like biology um diet is just the method that you eat right if you're, um, every day you eat pizza, pizza is part of your diet, right? Um, dieting is not a months to years thing. It is, you have to, if, if you make it temporary, which means you end it in a few months or you end it after a couple of years, if you make your change temporary, then you are saying, I am okay with returning to my previous obesity in the future that's the problem a diet uh, to to lose weight sustainably you need a sustainable diet so it's not a months to years thing it's the rest of your life hello pale horse how are you glad you can join us um also to add what was said before teach looks at the chat uh what i should have done after losing all the weight was obviously start eating normally quote unquote and skipping out on fast food um i don't know again with that normally you know is is the average diet in your nation a good one you know what i mean 
Um, let's see. Yeah, that's plus size for sure. I agree that there are many obese people in Korea now. The average in the U.S. is considered fat, not just overweight. Yeah, I mean, but we're talking about like uh, fat. I would say is is a personal perspective. Like it's it's a very subjective thing. Um, so that's why we want to say overweight or obese because those are medical like medically defined terms. Um, their plastic surgeons can magic away the fat though, not necessarily. Um, and yeah, there are I mean there are issues with that, of course. I mean every there's a uh, risk, you know, for that. Um, as a very European person, would Neanderthal genes affect how easy I gain or lose weight? It would affect how easily you gain or lose muscle mass. Uh, the Venus of Willendorf used to be admired. Not as much today. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and look at the Venus of Willendorf. Let's go ahead and look at that face. Right? I don't think anybody should be looking at that. I mean, that's literally like objectification. Um, but one person had a really interesting way to talk about it that the Venus of Willendorf maybe looks a bit odd from the front. But if you're a overweight or obese woman and you're looking down at your body, that's what you would feel that you look like. Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting thing. I mean, but is this really, look, I mean, is this is what we're going to take for the ideal with these tiny little arms. Honestly, honestly, I had those tiny little arms, though. Um, and again, we're not talking about admiring a, a fetish. And a fetish here is like a, a, like a totem, like a religious totem, not like, not like a sexual fetish. Um, we're not talking about that. We're talking about health. We're not talking about what some people thought was attractive. We're talking about health, okay? Um, health is a lot more objective than somebody's attractiveness. I think the first part didn't post. Underweight and overweight people who insist they can't change tend to overestimate calories on one side and underestimate on the other. That's true, yeah. There's, uh, for example, an underweight person might skip a meal all day. Like, they might not eat at all. Just not hungry, just too busy, whatever. And then when they sit down and eat with their friends, they eat everything and a little bit more that their friends are eating. So maybe their friends would have, you know, three slices of pizza. They'll have five slices of pizza. And their friend will be like, wow, you eat so much. How come you don't gain weight? Oh, I wish I could eat like you. And neither of them are like understanding that the amount of food that this person ate is still not enough for their metabolism so they gain weight right um but yeah the the results like with studies it's definitely proven that people underestimate um what they what they eat um let's see um i do agree that models should be more diverse however they should do that for males and females not just for females a lot of male models are still ripped i yeah i agree right i totally agree um, I'm just talking from, from my perspective, right? I'm not looking to buy, I mean, maybe they should just do that with all the clothes, you know, clothes, clothes are just whatever you want to wear, right? Um, let's see. Can your skin ever return to normal after being obese and then return to a healthy weight? No. Not even with surgery. No. There, there's this, I don't know why people started this lie. I believed it that. As long as you do it healthily or whatever, that you're going to, you know, your skin bounces back. It doesn't. And and when you think about it for two seconds, right, it, it actually doesn't make any sense. Your body used a lot of, um, your body used up a lot of uh, uh, resources to manufacture more skin cells. Why is it going to cannibalize them selectively when you're not starving, Right. That that's what it would have to do to selectively cannibalize certain parts of your um, skin tissue. How how could you possibly do that? You know, like what what would that even look like? You just have these open sores that your body has chosen to eat, even though you're not starving. It makes no sense. Even after skin surgery, it's it's not the same. That skin has been stretched out. It's not the same. Nike is starting to get more overweight models from men. Old Navy is plus size male models. 
but you don't see many of them. That's true, for sure. Uh, I'm sure that you know how much food the average Korean eat, drink, street foods. Um, there's no way I can maintain my size if I'm in Korea. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of food. Um, even something like, uh, let me see, how do we write that in English? Talk bulky. Uh, Sunday. Let's see if we see that. Okay. So you might have this with your friends as a snack between like on your way home. You guys might get like 1400 calories each depending on the size, right? Even still 700 calories for a snack. If it's totaling 1400, 700 calories for a snack. And then you go home and you're like, oh, I didn't eat because there's this this uh, idea in Korea that you have to have rice to make it an actual meal. So if there's no rice, it's a snack. <laughs> and so the like the the students will do this. They'll they'll be finished with you know their lessons and stuff for the day, and they'll be finished you know kind of later in the day. They'll grab this with a friend, and then they'll go home and eat a full meal. And I'm not talking like traditional Korean like healthy. No, it's like their parents will order them like a box of fried chicken or a bunch of like Chinese food or something. Um, and then they wonder like, oh, I don't know why I don't, I don't eat too much or like, they still feel like they don't eat that much, but yeah. Um, how's it going tonight? Sad I missed most of the video. It's, it's going, it's going. Um, the habits got you there, not the lifestyle. Um, yeah, dual flame. I don't, I don't know what you mean about, um, fat males and how they need to deal with it. Um, that was automatically hidden and I think we're just going to keep it hidden um that that again we're not talking about your subjective feelings about this we're talking about do those people exist yes do they want to buy clothing products yes do they want a model that's similar to their shape to show this is how you can expect it to look on you yes that's all we're talking about here uh, it's the same with that idea about the venus of willendorf being this like ideal who cares we're talking about health, right? The Venus of Willendorf would be obese, okay? <laughs> Never seen the Venus had arms before. Yeah, they're tiny. Um, I would say the Swedish diet's a good one. Meat, potatoes, veggies, no pineapple. Go away. Get out of here, Ratza. That's it. <laughs> yeah, some people tell me I don't need to lose weight. I'm not fat. It's based on the USA average and not fact. Right. Like, I, I had visited um, back home and it was in the summer huge difference between where my family lives and uh in the summer and then where korea um, is in the summer in terms of um heat and humidity so when i went to visit my family my goodness i was freezing just the relative change in temperature it's freezing and so when one of my buddies was like, I was like, man, do you, like, he wanted to go for a walk. And I was like, yeah, we can go for a walk. But do you have like a jacket or something? I am freezing. And he's like, of course you are. You're, you're so light. You're going to blow away with the wind. You're like a little kitten. I'm like, what? I'm the same weight I was in the Marines, you know? <laughs> like, what? Somebody like me blows away in the wind. Are you serious? You know, but they're comparing me to the U.S. average. Yeah. Um, skin can scratch, but it's not like a rubber band that just bounces back. Right. Men have big and tall stores. They're stocked for tall and overweight men. That's true. Um, but if a company is going to put out, like if a company like, um, I don't know, what's, what's a company? Calvin Klein, uh, Tommy Hilfiger, something. If they're going to make um, products to fit someone that might be triple XL or quadruple XL, they should also provide a model just to give that like an idea like, hey, it's going to look like this, you know. And the late night snack, right. Oh, man, Obyung, there was this time I went to um, a huishik. For those of you that don't know, it's like a social meal with your coworkers. And there was somebody, you know, I noticed she gained some weight and I noticed she was doing all the grilling and not feeding herself. And I'm like, okay, she's, she's trying to stick to a diet, whatever. And one of the, the male coworkers were like, hey, you need to eat something. And just the look on her face, like, I don't know, she was, she was scared. I'm like, I know that look. And so I said, oh, you know, don't worry. Um, that, uh, you know, don't worry. She doesn't need to eat any, anything. 
you know, she's drinking her calories just to kind of make like a joke. And they were like drinking calories. I was like, yeah. Soju looks like water, but it's it's not calorie free. And they said they were just like still shocked. And I was like, there's like 550 calories per bottle of soju. And they they all grabbed their phones, looked at it, and like I saw their eyes popping out. And I was just like, what did you think? <laughs> you know? But here they're eating this meal of samgyeopsal, which is a uh, pork belly, but it's thicker cut than bacon is, and it's also not smoked. Some gip yeah, we go. I mean, look at the fat. This is a layer of skin fat, and there's a thin layer of meat. This is something people will go out and eat. Is it delicious? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Not lying. Okay. We have evolved to enjoy fat. Okay. But to do this and down two bottles of soju per person or something like that. I mean, this is, this is an insane meal, right? But some people have that bias that, well, it's, it's a Korean meal. Therefore it's healthy. Like, whoa, there, buddy. Negatory morning glory. Uh, what do you think about fat storing toxins? I at least heard that is true. Um, toxins you'd have to I, like define, right? Um, there are certain environmental chemicals. Um, I think mercury is one of them. I think that do stay stored in the body fat. I think lead is another one. Um, but that doesn't mean that everything is stored there and that we can't just say toxins, right? We got to be careful with how we phrase that. Um, Swedish cuisine also has a lot of fish and shellfish and stuff. I would say there's pretty healthy food in general. Okay, but is that what everybody's usually eating? So it's not like, you know, akavit and kebab, right? What What's like the average diet actually like? You know what I mean? Because there's traditional diets. Cool. And then there's like the diet that like everybody's actually eating. Yeah. Uh, the family that owns Samsung have a genetic problem that tend to die early. Money can't do much about it. That sucks. What causes it? Uh, my mom understandably lost her damn mind when I was a model and modeled plus size clothing, clothing at a modern size zero. Yeah, it's insane. It's evening here. Don't want to eat anything. Okay. Um, we can look at something cute. We can look at something gross. Um, how about athlete's foot? You're welcome. <laughs> Mm. and now we'll look at something cute to get rid of this idea how about a uh, adorable uh baby oh let's do bat that's a good time oh the baby that's a good time there you go hopefully you don't want to eat that well i like heavy metals um i i i want to like do like a like a scream and like a like a head banging but I shouldn't because my migraine. But yes, no, I get you. <laughs> I like heavy metal too. Um, Some of you saw looks tasty. I mean, yeah, it's delicious. It's just going to, it's not good for you. <laughs> That's what people uh, are usually eating. We have actual food culture. That's great. That's great. Um, Yeah, hi, Sugar. If you want to Google, Google blue rat. I'm scared because I know blue waffle is not something you want to Google. All right, let's go back to the haze thing to try to keep slightly on topic. Um, how is it fair that my tax dollars pay for the health care of fat people? Tax dollars pay for all kinds of things unless someone has a list of everything that their tax dollars pay for broken down by what they do and don't want to pay this and suggest prejudice against fat people. So I, again, I, I, I don't, I mean, what, what is this? What's the logical fallacy here? You know what I mean? <laughs> um, no, that's not, I, I guess, what what is this, whataboutism, you know? Um, then if, let, let's say that my, you know, we know that some of our, the tax dollars, like in the United States, they go for paying for, like, corporate welfare. I think a lot of people are against that and want that to be fixed. That doesn't mean, like, well, you know, you you pay for corporate welfare and, you know, you're just prejudiced against fat people if you don't want to pay. No, I don't want to pay for either right? I don't want to pay for either. Okay. However, as a person existing in a society where I cannot control what other people do, and we know that obesity exists, it's increasing. And we also know that it increases risk of other diseases, like 
contagious or how, how easy it is for people to get coronavirus, for example. Okay. That being said, to live in a society where I want, where we want to focus on health, I'm okay with my tax dollars paying for that. So for example, some friends and I were talking about the idea that um, the first round of the COVID vaccines, uh, that's going to go to the high risk groups like medical personnel and people that have to live in a hospice or something like that. And then the next round um, that goes to people that are like at an increased risk of disease, such as the obese. And they were upset about that. And I agree, that's very upsetting. But at the same time, I still don't want them walking around unvaccinated, cause, you know, spreading more of this disease. If we understand, and so that's again, that thing where, what do my feelings say about it? And then what does the medical science say behind it? The medical science says to vaccinate them is the smarter choice. So I have to go with that. Personally, if I'm upset about it, fine. But I, I can't just, you know, I can't just say, well, I don't like it. So I'm going to choose against it. Just, be, I mean, that would be, you know, that would be a bias, right? We don't want to, we don't want to just make those kinds of decisions because somebody can make those decisions about me for whatever reason, you know. Um, but I, I really disagree with the the argumentation here that, well, you know, your tax dollars pay for a lot of stuff. So, you know, why would you target fat? No, they, no, fix the tax system. <laughs> right, fix it. <laughs> okay. Um, even if you believe that fat people cost more, it's a slippery slope. So those of us who don't drink get to opt out of our tax dollars paying for alcohol related health problems. Again, this is, again, these are things that we should look at, right? It's not like, well, it's, it's all like a dumpster fire anyway. I'm just going to jump into this too. No, let's put out the fire. You know what I mean? Um, this whole argument collapses under a bit of scrutiny. I, I wouldn't say this is scrutiny. I, I would say this is really poor argumentation. Uh, let's see what you guys are saying in the chat. Let's see. Um, Okinawans are known for a, lo a long life, but among young people who start eating American foods in addition to high carb Okinawan foods, they tend to be obese like South Pacific Islanders. Right. Um, they're also known for their long life because of, uh, there's like a food culture, uh, where you eat until 80% full. And that's actually supported by science where if you reduce your amount of calories, um, by a certain amount, I think it's, it's, I think it's pretty drastic, uh, like 33%. Um, but you make sure that you're getting all your nutrition that also promotes longevity. So the Okinawans just happen to get it right in that case. Um, that's why when you change the diet, they just start dying. Yeah. As a people, Bedouins generally lived to 98 or near there, especially in the uh, Negev region when they introduced Pop-Tarts and Jiffy peanut butter. Um, sudden rheumatism made an appearance. Right. Um, so we, again, we have to be careful about, um, you know, I, I would say it's it's that same the same issue that we were talking about with um you know are Korean plus size models actually fat or are they just like normal looking for Westerners um this idea that just being born into a certain genetic group somehow puts you in this special category um no a lot of it is just the food right which is good because that means that we can figure out longevity you know how can we can increase our longevity with just our diet and then achieve that you know how cool is that um i meant earlier that i mostly meant heavy metals rather than toxic oh, okay well i still like heavy metal um but yeah that that those as far as i know tend to build up in the in the fat yeah i'm still 50 50 with the skin th theory it used to be 324 um, I haven't had much skin ever. My fat was even. The skin thing really seemed to vary a lot. I do lift weights. A person with muscle mass, but I lean more towards in jeans. I'm not sure how I'll look afterwards. Um, yeah, so if you're more even, for example, that's one thing. And I know you do lift weights, and that's another factor, right? For sure. For me, I was built like a pyramid, right? I was huge in the bottom, just huge. 
And so for me, yeah, definitely, definitely wanted that skin, um, uh, wanted that skin, uh, reduction for sure. I also think it's, it's, it's how, also how much you might scrutinize yourself. Um, I would say that after I had initially lost the weight, I didn't think I had excess or, uh, I didn't think I had, um, like extra skin, like the baggy skin. Um, but as I had gotten older and as I had started to live in that body, I realized, oh, you know, I actually have a lot and I, I would actually grab all of the skin, like handfuls of it and just stretch it. And I'm like, dang, how did I never see this before? Like, how did I not notice this before? Um, I don't know. Age might be a factor as well. Um, yeah. Let's see. Put a photo on Discord. Thank you. Um, it's also like similar to how some dogs are called blue. Yeah. Or like the Russian blue cats. Um, I hope I got that right and didn't set her up. Yeah. It's actual blue rat. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you guys can definitely share the rat for sure. The next one, how can you say it's okay to be fat? The answer is because nobody needs anyone else's permission or approval to live in or be happy with their body. Cool. Again, these are, these are like those truisms, right? Nobody really argues with it. Okay. Um, fat people have the right to light li life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that includes the right to live life. Okay. Cool. Without the government waging war on us. Or having other people tell us that what we need to do, what they think, in hopes that they will look the way that we should look. Okay, but again, this is not... First of all, I don't think the government is waging war on obesity. If they were, they're doing a terrible job of it, right? Because it's increasing. Um, having other people tell us what we need to do, what they think that we should, in hopes to change the way that we look. I mean, that's... Again, we've talked about that earlier. Um, people comment on your body. They're just going to do that. If you wear makeup, you don't wear enough makeup. I had this weird guy on, on the subway and I had to just tell him he's just a sexist. He, he wanted to talk to me and I, I thought he wanted to just like practice English or something. And he, he was asking if my hair was short and it was short at the time. And so I said, yes. And he gave me this like, oh, like face and like sound. And I was like, oh, okay. And he's like wearing makeup. And I had like giant, like huge blue, like this was obvious makeup. Like, yes, of course it's makeup. He's like, oh, oh, he was so mad. And he, and I was just like, you know, I told him in Korean that he was sexist. And he's like, no, 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 no. I was like, well, you know, he, this, this stranger on the subway was, I, I don't, and again, I, what was he thinking that, that we were going to date? Like, what, what the hell? And he, he, that was the way he, he wanted to talk to me was, to criticize that my hair was too short for his liking and that I had makeup and he didn't like makeup. What? Right? And again, you just kind of write the person off as that's that person is clearly disturbed in some way, right? Just out of touch with reality. I don't take it as a personal attack that somebody's waging war on my body and all this other stuff. I think that person's the one that's got a problem. Period. If it's my family and they're giving their comments, they might just be jerks, right? They might just be people that are, you know, failing a certain way or whatever. And, you know, I'm sure we, all of those family members that give us those unsolicited, unsolicited advice about too much this or not enough that. But if it's in the case of something like, I wear too much makeup let's say let's let's just give you guys like a visual example something like um i don't know 1980s goth makeup okay so let's say that i am wearing this particular look and if you guys aren't able to watch it's very heavy eye makeup um very heavy uh lip makeup a very um, I would say artistic, maybe, um, hairstyle and color. Like it's an, un it's a blue. And if my family gives me some comment about, oh, that's too much or whatever, it's not pretty. Okay. That's them just, you know, being inappropriate. But if I'm coming home every day 
and complaining that, you know, I just, it's so hard to find a job. Every time I go in for a job interview, they just kind of laugh me out of there. And my family member says, well, you know, I know that you really like your makeup, but maybe this is limiting you from achieving another goal. Maybe you can do it a different way or change your hair a different way. I can't say that this person is hating me, oppressing me, waging a war on me. They are recognizing that there's something I'm doing that's stopping me from reaching a goal. And we can try to say, well, wouldn't it be great to live in a society that didn't judge? Okay, great. I agree with that. But that's not where we live right now. That being said, this isn't even that subjective or arbitrary. This is somebody who's complaining, let's say, about their health or a loved one worried that they're going to bury you early saying, you know, I just, I love you so much and I, I wish you would just lose some weight because I want you to be around for a long time. That is not somebody saying that you should change your body because I think it looks unattractive. This is a person citing medical information to let you know, I'm scared that you're going to die and I'm going to be left without you and I love you and I don't want to be there like that. That That is a totally different case, isn't it? If some jerk is making a comment like, um, you know, you're walking down the street and they make some comment at you. Yeah, that's that person's being a jerk. That's their own issue, right? But to suggest that that's the only type of person that comments on your body. No, right? No. Let's see what you guys are saying in the chat. Um, let's see. Stress about the skin, blue rat. Some people's skin and fascia are damaged. That's true. That's true. Um, she saw us going on topic. She'll blame me for it and give me another. No, no. If you guys go off topic while you're chatting to each other, I usually just ignore it. Like I just skip it over because you guys are talking and that's like, you're welcome to do that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I don't. And, but if I read it, it's not applying to me because we're not talking about the topic. You guys are having your own conversation. Go for it. You get an F for being a bad person, Ratso, that doesn't like pineapple. That's all. <laughs> Since you mentioned Taco Bell, have you heard that corn is a Native American's revenge? Uh, Europeans developed all kinds of health problems because of corn. Uh, I haven't heard that about Europeans developing health problems because of corn. Um, but no, I haven't heard. I haven't heard that, no. I wonder something. Is it possible we aren't evolved to eat carbs much? How long ago did we start eating it? Okay, that, you know what? That's a really good question, Joshua. Um, so there's this concept of a paleo diet, which right away is inappropriate because we did not all have the same ancestors, Right. The other problem, too, is there's this idea between, like, this idea of hunter-gatherer societies that, yeah, I mean, hunting a mammoth, that's, like, a big deal, right? And that's awesome. That is not where the majority of our food came from. About 90% of our diet, on average, like, the daily average, was stuff we gathered. So, yes, we could gather nuts, which would not be a carb. We could gather eggs, which is not a carbohydrate. Um, but most of the stuff we gathered is carbohydrates. Yeah. So um, I don't think it's... Um, I, I would say if we're talking about the evolutionary timeline and which one we've consumed more, plant products versus animal products, definitely plant products. 100%. 100%. Um, but... You know, there's a lot of newer research and stuff about gut bacteria and gut flora and stuff. Um, I came to Korea with a group of teachers and I remember we had uh, like a orientation period. So we had to be around each other for, for a while. And a lot of them started complaining about gastro issues because of the rice. And to me, I'd never heard that <laughs> because I grew up eating rice. Um, but I will say I get a lot of bloating issues if I eat bread. We didn't eat a lot of bread and pasta. Um, so when I do eat something like that, yeah, I feel, you know, uncomfortable. I wouldn't say it's, it's like a, I wouldn't say it's celiacs or anything. It's not a, not a gluten, um, allergy. Um, 
but I, I think that there is something to say about your your natural diet and perhaps, you know, just you inherited some gut bacteria, um, perhaps in the womb. Um, so I think there's something about that that we should definitely be looked into. But yeah. Um, yeah. And so I read the rest of your your comment here. How long did humanity start eating and cultivating them compared to how long we've been eating fat? Um, fat is, again, that's that's a hard to that's a hard to get one. You know it's fat is really hard to get in nature really is um we can have things like olives nuts avocado if you live in that area um certain types of fatty fish but other than that you're having to hunt and hunting again that is that's a hard one you know that's hard um when fat became more easy to access that would be when we had animal agriculture but we were having animal agriculture at the same time as we had uh, wheat agriculture so plant agriculture and animal agriculture um had developed at the same time yeah um as far as how long ago did humanity start cultivating it um for wheat at least ten thousand years ago but likely older um but for like settling down and creating civilizations based around agriculture yeah at least ten thousand years ago but again we we have not it's not like we had these carnivorous diets and and that's why that's what i'm trying to to clarify um we were we were foragers for the most part you know what i mean we were foragers for the most part yeah um and if you think about it too you know carbohydrates um as a food not like as a macronutrient but as a food that's going to have most of what we need right it's going to have um you get calcium from plants you get uh, amino acids from plants, you get all kinds of stuff from plants, all types of vitamins, fiber, all this stuff that we need, whereas from meat, we don't. So we've definitely evolved based on this plant diet, for sure. Does that mean that we'll die if we eat meat? No. But an idea that we need to have these really like fat heavy diets like our ancestors, our, our ancestors do not eat like that. Um, some of them during an ice age, okay if they were north enough sure um but this idea that our ancestors were like these like subsisted off of you know buffalo and and uh and like mastodon no no that is that's not it um let's see it means i can sleep in every day that's true uh i can't stand dealing with the cramps on the metro road that's gross yeah um, so you, so dual flame says, I can tell you homo sapiens have been eating fat much longer. Yeah, I'm not, I, I'm not, I think this is just, I, I don't know again where, where that came from. Um, so even just in our, uh, like our ancestry, like our evolutionary ancestry, um, we are the most, I guess, quote unquote animal protein that we would get on a daily basis was from bugs. Like we were, we were foragers that, that is just. That's just what we are. That's why we have so many flat teeth, weak jaws. You know, we are foragers. Um, yeah, I have a very black and white perspective. Um, when something does not have to be absolute, I will overthink it. Oh, don't worry. Um, he was upset that he has short hair and makeup. Might be something up with him. Well, yeah, of course there's something up with him. That's that's the point. The point is that in this example here on this website, this person is taking it as like they're they're fighting against some system or, or something that you know somehow i have failed because i'm obese no, no it's just the other person's got a problem like if somebody's on the metro and just like oh you're fat you know and you're just standing there you're not like taking up two seats or something yeah you know um koreans over 60 just found out hostile work environment as soon as you walked into the room, they would stop thinking and know they're not your students. Oh, goodness. Obesity and related diseases are good for the economy, specifically food manufacturing, dining, healthcare sectors. Therefore, the government is not truly interested in reduction of obesity or the tax revenue it generates. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, I would say that's definitely true in the United States, um, but in places where there's like um, national healthcare 
it makes the government lose money. Yeah. So they they would definitely do that. There is no f in pineapple. I saw something that said pineapple before. That was pretty good. Uh, people ignore the fact that different nations had different foods since the introduction of the potatoes. We don't have a word for it in Arabic and other grains. Obesity epidemic started. Um, yeah, I don't know about the introduction of potatoes necessarily. Um, because the potato, with the exception of the Pacific Islands, um, which is a totally different, really cool you know, thing we'll talk about in geography. But, um, you know, that's not suddenly going to spike the obesity thing now again you might have an inflammatory response minor where it might make you bloated or something afterwards and you know there there's a lot of things that that may not be exactly black and white with it for sure um but yeah so joshua when you say carbs what do you mean because i've heard like carbohydrate is like is is a very general term but when people talk about carbs for some reason like they only mean sugar are you talking about sugar is that what you're talking about if you're talking about sugar please say sugar because when we're talking about carbohydrates we're talking about pretty much everything that grows out of the ground so like uh, broccoli or something um you mean all carbohydrates and you're asking did the stuff we forage have many carbs so like i said with the exception of uh, with the exception of eggs, insects, and nuts, if we could find them. Um, and yeah, eggs, insects, and nuts, if we could find them. Um, of course, they're going to be carbohydrates. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, these are these are greens, fruits, um, any kind of tubers that we could find, like root vegetables and stuff. Um, yeah, absolutely. Carbohydrates. Absolutely. Um, let's see, corn oil, corn fed beef, corn syrup, um, all cases of high cholesterol, diabetic, obese, Europeans cannot process corn like Native Americans. So, Obiang, I think you might be falling into, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you might be falling into this trap that I see a lot of Koreans fall into here, where they blame foreign food for Korea's increasing obesity. Like, they ignore the amounts that they eat they ignore um a lot of a lot of stuff like they they ignore that they have a, a diet that's not very good um high in like fresh fruits and vegetables and stuff like that that the rice that they eat has been stripped of all its nutrition you know um high con consumption of soju um so there's like this idea that obesity is an outside thing that was imported so i don't want you to fall into that trap i don't know if you are but i just want to make sure like it's it's not um it's a it's a correlation and causation thing and again we can look at you know sp specifics and gut bacteria and stuff but this would be a correlation causation thing so when corn and overly processed corn became more available to people with european ancestry that was also the time they were getting richer they were able to afford more food. They were able to have a little bit more free time. They were able to relax a little bit more, purchase more items. Um, some of those things like corn syrup, they contribute just more calories to the diet overall. Do you see what I'm saying? So you would have to show that corn is so inadequately processed in the body of Europeans that it causes them to drastically change their metabolism so that their food is so inefficiently used that now they are forced to just store fat on their body even though they're only eating 1800 calories a day that's what you're arguing so what i'm saying is that the oil the excess beef the excess corn syrup um those are going to increase um though just just all the excess that is going to increase the cases of obesity which brings with it you know the diabetes and high cholesterol and all of that stuff um so this is the correlation causation thing um let's see seems our cattle is grain fed apparently yeah a lot of the 
a lot of stuff in the U.S. is just with corn. Um, that was a post Great Depression thing, um, just to encourage farmers to grow a bunch of corn. Yeah. Uh, confusing culture with science is very common. I have two different cultures in my family. They have different things about the science. still there. Yeah. I'm not talking about the amount of foods available. I'm specifically talking about corn specifically causing problems to people who are not evolved to process. So you'll have to, you'll have to provide a source, right? Because again, that's what you're saying. You're saying that corn is so wildly foreign as a concept to anyone with European genetics that it drastically alters their metabolism to the point that even if they eat less than what they need to maintain their weight, they're going to gain weight. That's, that's, that would be corn specifically causing problems. So if you're not talking about excess amounts, what you're saying is that a person who is maintaining their weight at 2000 calories a day, and they merely swap out I don't know, uh, 400 calories of wheat for 400 calories of corn. So they have 2000 calories a day that it suddenly does something to their body that despite no other change, they are drastically jumping into obesity territory on a, a massive scale of the population. So that's, that's what that would mean. If it's not the amount of food, it's only corn that a person is okay eating 2,000 calories a day, maintaining their weight. But as soon as they swap out whatever other calories for corn calories, that it causes their metabolisms to be so uh, damaged that they gain so much weight that it pushes them into an obesity territory. Um, corn is pretty new, only like 10,000 years old. We, we don't want to fall into, I forget what it's called, the natural fallacy or the naturalism fallacy. I forget which one it is. But we don't want to fall into that idea that just because our ancestors didn't evolve with it, that automatically it's going to be negative for us. We don't want to fall into that, right? Our, our ancestors didn't evolve with antibiotics either, you know. Um, are these people who are maize intolerant to the same degree that I've heard people are lactose intolerant? So, so this is not what we're talking about, Sugal. So I'm not saying that people are, are maize intolerant. I'm not saying that. Obiung is making the claim that merely introducing corn and nothing else, keeping all calories the same, but introducing corn to the European diet somehow damaged their metabolism so much that it caused a huge percentage of the population to become obese and and i'm saying i i don't i don't follow that claim i i don't that i'm saying that's that's something that i find very difficult to believe um so lactose intolerance means you're gonna poop and stuff like you're getting bad gas and things um you can't digest lactose so maize intolerance and lactose intolerance wouldn't even be the same concept here. Um, what what somebody is, is saying or cl making the claim of is that the corn itself is damaging the metabolism to the point that a person gains many, 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 many kilograms, even though they haven't increased their, their intake at all. So Obiung, you said you're making a very scientific case. I, I'm going to, I'm again, I, I'm... I'm not saying you're, nothing you cited, like you didn't cite anything. So can you maybe, I know you can't share links, but can you maybe share the title and we can look it up together? Uh, because again, what you're saying is that everything equal, everything equal, and there's been no change in there that, that, that w I mean, what, what is corn doing that is damaged them so much yeah sure no problem um i know with cows it causes them to bulk up because they can't digest it properly um but that's that's not, i don't think that's the same thing you're saying yeah so obyung is citing peer-reviewed literature it's an observation i i think that he's saying he's citing peer-reviewed literature um so he's he's gonna grab it that's all yeah um, so I'm wondering if it's, I'm just wondering what other factors would be there. Cause I've heard people, 
um, place some blame, like they wanted to do taxes and stuff on things like corn syrup, for example. Um, but the problem was there wasn't a way to demonstrate that just by swap, swap, like swapping out corn syrup, I'm sorry, other, other types of sugar for corn syrup, for example, um, that, that in and of itself increased, um, somebody's weight. Now, what some people have been saying is that corn syrup, because it's cheaper than sugar, has made, um, things like cola very cheap. And because it's very cheap and affordable and tastes good, more people are buying it. Overall, they're increasing their calories in the day. And that overall increase in cheap calories has led to an increase in weight. That makes sense. But from what I understand, and I could be misunderstanding it, um, from what I understand that Obyung is saying is that just by, let's say if I used a teaspoon of sugar in every coffee that I have, and I have 10 coffees in the day or something, and that did not put me over my calorie limit in the day, if I just simply swapped out that teaspoon of sugar for a teaspoon of corn syrup, that if I had European DNA, then it would damage my metabolism to the point that I would become obese. I would gain tens of kilos or tens of pounds just by doing that. No other change. Yeah. Um, cows are actually equipped to eat plant-based materials, whereas humans are not. No, I'm not, I'm not, um, so dual flame, I, I'm, I'm not sure where you got the idea that humans are not equipped to eat plants. I mean, that's, that's how we evolved. That's our, like, our human, like, our, our hominid ancestry as well. Um, so if they bulk up because they can't digest it properly, why should I eat it? Oh, you mean not equipped as much? Okay. Yeah. Like we don't have, you know, two or three stomachs and stuff. Um, so again, just because you can eat plants doesn't mean you can eat every plant, right? That's like saying, um, well, uh, belladonna is, uh, poison ivy is a plant and I shouldn't eat that. Therefore, why should I eat any plant? Right? So cows did not evolve eating, eating corn, right? That's not what their diet is. So if you're feeding somebody something they're not digesting, of course it's going to be bad for them, right? I can't just feed you a bunch of uh, wood chips, right? If I just fed you a bunch of sawdust or something, um, that's not good for you. Okay. Um, but yeah, again, it's, it's, I'm not, poison ivy is a Batman villain. All right, fine. Uh, poison hemlock or something. Or, um, well, it's not a plant, but I was going to say like different types of, of fungi, but those aren't plants. Yeah. The pineapple to Batman's pizza. So you don't like poison ivy. The Batman villain. Um, but yeah, so I like cows. Cows are not supposed to be eating corn. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> That's all it is. Uh, they're not supposed to be eating corn. Just like we're not supposed to be eating certain foods. Yeah. Sawdust. Right. Right. I mean, we can. We can. We could eat it. You know, we won't die. But should we be eating it? No. You know, it's gonna cause problems for us. Hemlock, yeah, and I was thinking, what, like, belladonna, isn't that another one, right? That's a plant, so if we can eat plants, how come I can't eat belladonna? Ergo, I shouldn't be eating plants? That doesn't make a bunch of sense, right? Um, yeah, that doesn't make a bunch of sense. Um, corn was, was, um, the way that it used to be grown, um, especially, they had to mix it with, um, a type of ash, to get some kind of niacin reaction. I, I don't, I don't know exactly. Um, but this was, was created to be edible for humans. Right. Um, trying to cash in on the environment. It could be, could be rats for poison ivy. Could be. So while you guys are working on that, uh, we're going to go for the rest of this. And I think that actually was, was that. So I did want to go through this thing called diagnosis fat on Twitter. Okay. Um, 
So diagnosis fat is a hashtag where people that are overweight or obese talk about the negative encounters they've had with their doctors and say that they weren't being paid attention to because they were obese or overweight. Now, of course that happens. Doctors are people and of course they are biased. However, a doctor making a comment about your weight is not necessarily the same thing. Remember, the doctor is concerned with your optimal health. While you're there, they're going to want to talk to you about your weight if your weight is an issue, right? Overweight or underweight. Um, let's see, they mostly eat grass, but other plants as well. Right, but they did not evolve to eat corn in the same way. I mean, you, I, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but they actually feed the United States... <laughs> Uh, they they give um, farmed fish. They feed them corn as well. Yeah. But again, it's the same. It's like the same idea that if if I can eat meat, and a hyena can eat meat, and a hyena can eat meat that's been dead for two weeks, therefore I should be able to eat meat that's been dead for two weeks. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't work. Um, it's not what we evolved eating and it again the corn was specifically bred for us but see we didn't evolve to eat corn as well right we we evolved the corn to be edible that's that's what i'm saying we evolved the corn to be edible um the argument that's being or the the discussion i guess that's being had here is is corn is corn's edibility (laughs) Uh, It's corn's bread edibility. Specific to Native Americans. How edible is it really? I I mean, I don't don't know how edible it is. I mean, what what do you mean? Like how much of it we digest? No, I don't know that off the top of my head. I I, I think you're talking about bioavailability, perhaps? I'm not sure. But but that's, again, that's not the, that's not the discussion. Okay, so I don't want to have... If we're going to have two different discussions, we have to know we're having two separate discussions. You're, you're arguing a separate thing. What is being argued here uh, that, that Obyung is, is saying and um, going to provide us um, some information for is the idea that corn as an edible, healthy product from the land is only edible, healthy for Native Americans and that for Europeans if they put corn into their mouth eat it and make it part of their diet that everything else that's normal right everything else normal they end up gaining so much weight even though they're only eating their like uh, 2500 calories or less or fewer That's a different story to say that that we are all homo sapiens. We're all the same, um, the same species. But one sect of our species is totally okay eating corn. And the other sect has such a, I would say, horrifying allergic reaction that they end up gaining half their body weight just by introducing it into their diet. That's what's being said. For you to ask, is corn part of a healthy human diet? That's a different question. That's a totally different question. So what we're talking about is, are the genetic differences between Native Americans and Europeans so great that merely introducing corn and keeping calories the same kicks European people into obesity territory? That's, that's, the, that's the why it's a different conversation. Yeah. All right, seven plus years for my cancer to be tested for, discovered and treated, diagnosis fat. Now I did click on this exogene.com. Uh, it doesn't doesn't work. Um, I guess I could just show you, or maybe it works now. Okay, it doesn't work. Um, my concern was that it could be like an Amberlynn Reed situation where Amberlynn Reed um, is very obese, had cancer, cancer uh, had a hysterectomy because I think it was uterine cancer and now is too fat for the diagnostic equipment so she's unable 
to get checked to see if they got all the cancer or if it spread, so on and so forth. So I wonder if that is the case here. Is it seven plus years for your cancer to be tested for di discovered and treated? Why? Right? Why did that happen? Um, to say it's diagnosis fat, we would have to be told the doctors utterly refused for whatever reason, even though all the signs were there and the doctor was like, you know what? I just hate fat people. Just lose some damn weight and then I'll, you know, check you or something like that. Right? Let me check the group chat. Um, that assumes Europeans and Native Americans genetically diverge significantly. Right, Nick. And that's just not what happened. What I'm talking about is like a gut bacteria thing. And that's, that, like, that goes as far back as like your mom, right? <laughs> um, or, you know, you could have a gut bacteria thing where you had evolved at a certain way. But again, it's, it's... <sighs> It's not going to put you into obesity territory simply by maintaining your calories, right? I may need extra time. That's fine. That's totally fine. Um, documentaries, peer-reviewed journals saying corn-fed beef has different omega-3 to 6 ratio, but I'll look it up. Now, I, I agree with you there. Corn-fed beef has a different omega-3 and omega-6 ratio. I agree with you. But what, what I thought you were saying was that merely introducing corn into the European diet is the entire cause of the obesity epidemic in Europe, uh, European Americans, and European Canadians, and I guess European Australians. Um, that's what I thought you were saying. So if I misunderstood you, great, because I, I wasn't, wasn't following that either. Um, but from my understanding, the diet, like the calories, like the daily calories consumed, that's been a huge change for sure. Um, and we also talked about this, I think it was before you jumped in dual flame, um, about the idea that we, it's, it's fun or natural, I would say more natural than fun, uh, for us to want to reduce health down to a concept. Like if, as long as I get this out of my diet, I'll be healthy. And that's unfortunately not the case. Um, of course, our food should be looked at. Of course, it should. Um, the way that it's produced, how much of it we're consuming. Um, you know, we ate a lot of this in the past, but actually, is this actually helpful to us? Um, if not, should we regulate it? Should we just let people know? You know, so there's a lot of, definitely there's a lot of stuff that we should, we should look at, um, for our diet. Absolutely. Um, and we have to be careful to not be like emotionally attached to our diet too. I think a lot of, a lot of people feel that because there's a huge cultural component to it. Um, but we, we do ha like, for example, you know, my, my culture eats a lot of seafood, but unfortunately there's a lot of mercury in seafood these days. It doesn't mean, you know, what, what does that mean now? You know, imagine telling a bunch of seafood eaters, Hey, it's going to kill you, you know? That's just going to upset them. You know what I mean? See you later, Ratza. <clears throat> uh, I'm not saying that corn is the only cause, but corn is the game changer. Okay, because the thing you said was something about um, even if the dot, like even if the calories were the same, like the ex the increase in food didn't account for it or something like that. Um, but yeah, Europeans and European Americans. Um, the reason that I'm saying I would agree that corn is the game changer is just because corn is cheap. It's put into everything. It makes everything cheaper. Therefore, it's a lot easier to get too many calories in the day. So it's cheaper to buy. Uh, it's, it's cheaper to make, to sweeten something with corn syrup than it is to sweeten it with white sugar. Therefore, if you are having a corn syrup based soda, that's going to sell for cheaper than an equivalent um, sugar-based soda. Therefore, someone who likes to drink soda will buy more of it because it's cheaper. And therefore, they're getting too many calories, right? So that, there is a relationship there, definitely. Um, but I don't think it's, but what you're saying, I think, is that it's a I mean, in the study that you may have read, like, I'm trying to think of, and again, I'm not saying that you're, you're a liar, that you're too stupid to understand it. I'm just trying to think of what might some other interpretations have been. 
such as maybe the study was only looking at Europeans and European Americans and what majorly changed in their diet. Um, well, if it is food, how come food suddenly became cheaper? Oh, it had to go back to corn. And yeah, I, again, I would agree with that. That's, that was a, by design, you know, by design after the Great Depression. Um, extracting high fructose corn syrup has been detrimental to our corn diet. And again, about, I agree because of the, the fact that it makes it cheaper. And high fructose corn syrup is like sugar is a way to make something taste good. So if we take out um, fat, which not only goes into this, you know, fat free diet kind of promotion, which some people, you know, agree with it or disagree with it, whatever. Um, but the um, uh, the idea that we're fat is also like if you want it to taste really good a lot of those fats are not as shelf stable as something like corn syrup so you can make a product cheaper you can make it last longer um so you can put it on sale more so forth so all these foods become way more available um and so that's i think another another aspect of the problem um but what i'm saying i'm questioning is the idea that european digestive systems cannot at all digest corn or corn byproducts to the point that only corn or corn byproducts even if their calorie consumption stays the same only corn and corn byproducts are going to cause a wild spike in their um their weight yeah Um, have you seen corn fed Midwestern girls? They're not even from East Germany. Honestly, I, you know what? I think I, when I'm having my, my migraine days, I miss a lot of jokes. Rats have found that out. So I don't, I don't know about the jokes that you, if, if that's a, if that's a joke you're making, uh, cause you said you're being bad, but yeah, I, I don't understand. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Let's see. So we're going to go through the diagnosis fat a little bit um, here. Let's see. Let's show this thread. Just because obesity is associated with condition doesn't mean it's the cause. Causation does is a correlation is not causation. There's no evidence that weight loss improves see again so look at look at how this this doctor is 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 doing this there's no evidence showing weight loss isolated from nutrition and exercise improves health so what they're saying is that if you go on a drastic weight loss diet where you're eating nothing but 500 calories of you know uh, cake and you're losing weight because you're only eating 500 calories a day and you're just lying down eating 500 calories of cake a day. There's no evidence showing that it improves health. Well, of course. <laughs> Nobody's asked. No, who ad who who which doctor advocated for that? Which doctor? Tell me. Which 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 of her colleagues is advocating for this? That oh yeah, you should just lose weight. Is it okay if I do cocaine to lose weight? Yes, that's totally fine. Just weight loss is the only fact. Like, which doctor is okay with that? You know, every doctor is like, let me send you to a, you know, let me send you to some other, you know, specialist and they can help you with this. And then we can, you know, try to set you up with this other person and help you out with that. I mean, the, 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 nobody is saying, like, which, which doctor is doing that? So it's just, abs it's absurd. It's so absurd, right? Um correlation doesn't mean causation is that true sure but i mean just because obesity is associated with a condition doesn't mean it's the cause if my if my patient comes in and they've they've got cancer right and i need to treat that cancer i'm going to still want them to lose weight the amount of drugs that we have to use, the the amount of recovery time after that, the negative effects on their immune system just by, by being obese, all of those are going to be a factor in their successful cancer treatment, right? Now, I could say, 
you know, it do, and, and that doesn't matter if their their obe or their cancer was caused by um, some chemical at work, for example. Maybe they were breathing something in at work, and and everybody that worked at that particular area, um, you know, they all got cancer or something. Sure, but I'm still gonna want the patient to lose weight while I'm treating them for cancer. You know, I mean, I've had to have surgery. Um, when I was, uh, heavier and when I was lighter, I recovered so much faster when I was lighter. Oh my goodness. Like just being obese is affecting so many things, right? So your doctor is still going to encourage that. Um, dieting and weight loss is not sustainable for most people. Most regain the weight. Okay. So again, we already talked about that, right? Going on a crash diet. No, which doctor is recommending that? Which doctor is like, yeah, yeah, just, uh, you know, have a, a can of, of uh, full sugar cola once a day and that's all your intake is. You know, which doctor is recommending that? Everybody has a set point range it likes to maintain. The body works hard to keep it, like increasing hunger on a diet. Yo-yo increases the set point. So wait, wait a minute. Everybody has a set point range it likes to maintain and then we can increase the set point. So how come there's no discussion on whether they can decrease the set point? And that's if there's a set point. And then what is a reasonable set point? Right? Whose set point is at 550 pounds? Who, who, which person has their body naturally saying, yeah, I have to get up to 550. Right? So, I mean, again, just like there's... It's so frustrating to see somebody with a degree... Do you know what I mean? Saying this stuff. Um, here we go. Wait, uh, this thing with the BMI. There's athletes of all sizes, including higher weights. Uh, and we talked about how that, that again, right here, that is not, that was an old belief that doctors had. We found it wasn't true. Okay. To be fair, you know, you might say, well, this came out in 2020 and this was 2021. Okay. But it came out in 2017 as well. So this is actually a repeat study. And in the middle of 2020, my goodness, in the middle of a pandemic, you're going to tell your patients, yeah, it's fine to be obese. Even though we know that obesity is a risk factor for like coming down with COVID. Not only just being exposed to the virus, of course, that's just, you know, environmental and stuff, but contracting the, the disease and then being harmed from it, you know. Um, the BMI is crap. Yeah, I said it. Insurance tables. Like, it wasn't created from insurance tables. It, it existed, like, it was created in the, in the 1800s uh, by, like, a mathematician. Uh, I think his name was Quetelet from Belgium. You know, it wasn't about these, like, a moral, I mean, this, uh, it makes me really sad to see this. <sighs> Weight stigma can lead to anxiety, depression. Okay, sure. I, I mean, we agree with this, right? But that's not by trying to help. Stigmatizing something isn't necessarily trying to help it. So we start off in a no judgment zone. I might even tell about the time I lied on my exercise doctor's form. Ha ha ha. To show that we all fear being judged. I mean, I get it. That's great. But why, why couldn't we start with that? Right? Why couldn't we start with this? You know, um, I care about giving your body more nutrition. Find it physical act okay great but again we can't deny the risk and that's that's what's so frustrating i mean somebody like this is is as bad as somebody who who gets a degree in biology and goes to work for a creationist website or somebody who is an md or a nurse practitioner and they're anti-vax you know and that's that's the unfortunate thing um that's why you want to ask if your doctor says something that sounds too weird or too good to be true, ask for the, the research, you know. Um, every doctor I've ever had, losing weight would help your bones and joints. Me, yes, I'm aware. Doctor, have you tried? Me, no, it's literally never occurred to me, is in a full body cast, mentally and emotionally crippled. Diagnosis fad. Here, this is... So this is this belief that you have to be physically active to lose weight. Being physically active is healthy in a different way. 
cool great that's great obviously if you're in a wheelchair if you're in a full body cast you're not your doctor is not going to expect you to go out and go for go for a jog right losing weight is is a diet thing it's done with your food intake so this idea that that oh i can't lose weight because i'm in a full body cast that that's that's out of touch with reality it's an excuse is what it is and of course losing weight helps your bones and joints and so that's that's another problem it's like it's not going to fix whatever like disorder or whatever that this person has right i still have my chronic pain issues you know but it's going to make them not as bad right it's like having a fire that's in your house versus a fire that's in your kitchen they're both bad right but one of them is is slightly more manageable you know what i mean let's go to the group chat um don't hate some of them farm girls are thick okay it's a classical obfuscation correlation doesn't imply causation is a basic truism but there's a reason why we tend to figure out causation using correlations right right and a lot of time the correlation does turn out to be the same as the causation um such as the case with type 2 diabetes right right um, it seems like some Hayes statements were plucked from the ED community, but the context was discarded. I will say for the ED, like the eating disorder community, um, there is a problem with with the idea that, um, I mean, maybe maybe we shouldn't even get into it because it's just I think it's it's going to take us down another path, and I do want to eventually rest my head. <laughs> uh, telling an underweight person or orthorexic person um, that weight loss equals therapy, right, right. I can actually speak to that for a personal experience. For three months straight, I ate a full and balanced 23 calorie diet without being too physically active and I lost 15 points. You mean 15 like BMI points? Um, not only does getting off weight or getting the weight off help with your knees, but it helps you be active and strengthen your muscles, which helps your bones. Right. Um, telling an obese person that weight loss, exclusive of nutrition and exercise equals enabling poor eating habits and progression of the disease. Oh, pounds. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. That's great. Um, I mean, a lot of, I think a lot of people here, myself included, um, you know, we changed our diet and lost weight, you know, and we've, you know, we're a mixed bunch. Um, you know, we have different backgrounds, um, different health issues and, you know, different metabolic issues as well. Um, you know, we're still able to, to do it. Um, let's see. 12 year old me had a sciatic nerve pain in my left leg. Doctor told me to exercise. It turns out it was cancer tumor in my pelvis. Um, yeah, something like that. I would say if you're having sciatica as a 12 year old, your doctor should, should have sat down with you, you know, which is, which is sucks. Right. I think, I think a lot of, I think the reason that I'm, I'm very, open about doctors being good bad or bad in different ways um it's because i've had to see so many doctors and i think a lot of people haven't or they've had like a family doctor i guess i think that's a thing that happens and they've they've gotten used to that um or they don't go to the doctor very often i i have to go to the doctor a lot i need to know that i can trust my doctor um my doctor's going to take me seriously, all this stuff, right? So you've had to, you know, you have to go around and find a doctor um, that's that's right for you. Even if your doctor trusts you and everything, if you just don't like your doctor's personality, that can discourage you from wanting to go, especially when you have to go as frequently as I do. And I'm just, just not, you know, you got, like, like it, you find that they're, the doctors are great people that want to help. Or people that are just busy and want money. Or people that are using their title and got sucked into a bunch of pseudoscience somehow. Um, you know, they're just humans. You know what I mean? It's like teachers. A lot of teachers. I've heard stu people that are, you know, adults. But as students, they had really bad experience with a teacher. And because they had trusted that teacher so much as a, an authority figure, it really, it really messed with them for a long time. And being a teacher, you realize, my goodness, there's, 
there's a lot of people that are just okay. There's people that really care. There's people that just do the job because they'd rather do this instead of, you know, serving coffee. Um, some people just suck and they think they're good. Um, you know, there, there's a whole lot of it. And I, I think once, I think that exposure helps when you realize that a doctor just because just because they went to medical school does not necessarily mean they were good at what they did and understood what they did. Um, we we can't look at them as an authority, right? It's okay to go find other doctors to get a consensus. You know, it's okay to do that. Let's see. Five pounds per month. Oh my God, I hate celery so much. Yeah, I really like it. I didn't like it at first, but I like it. Teacher was more respected and trusted than doctors um, at one time. Oh, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. Let's see. Went to the clinic with a deep wound on the sole of my foot. Uh, NP told me uh, it was caused by my excess weight. What? It was a rusty nail. So NP is going to be the nurse practitioner. This is not a diagnosis, right? Um... But again, you know, we're only getting this small clip, right? There's a good chance it was something like, I went to the clinic with a deep wound on my sole of my foot. The nurse practitioner asked me, do you have diabetes? And I said, yes. And the nurse practitioner asked me, do you have, uh, did you injure yourself? And you said, yes, but it doesn't seem to be healing. And so they say, aha, the deep wound that's not healing is caused by the fact that you are diabetic. You know what I mean? Like, you, you injure yourself when you have diabetes and it doesn't heal. So if you stepped on a rusty nail, bad times, right? But the fact that it's taking so long to heal, that it's, um, it's, it's smelling, it's getting worse and stuff like that. Even if you um, don't have tetanus, because they said a rusty nail and stuff. Um, even if there's no additional factor, um, it's not healing properly because of the diabetes. That's what I'm thinking probably happened, right? Um, having a doctor respond clearly not to the extent that it's a problem when I disclosed chronic anorexia and bulimia. Um, I'm not sure what chronic anorexia. I mean, either you have anorexia nervosa or you don't, right? Either you're bulimic or you're not. So I don't know chronic anorexia. I've never heard that as a phrase. So that makes me wonder if this person ever had it. Do you know what I mean? Um, it's it's like if I had told you I'm a Jehovah's Witness and I was trying to tell you a bunch of bad stuff about Jehovah's Witnesses, but I, I didn't use any of their quote unquote industry terms, right? If I kept saying that I was a Christian or I was a Jehovah's Witness a lot, but I didn't say witness because that's like one of their phrases. Or I kept referring to Yahweh as God, 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 and not Jehovah. Then you might wonder like, oh, that's, that's odd. Why, you know, were you ever really a Jehovah's Witness? Um, so somebody who was like diagnosed with this, they would say, I disclosed, um, you know, my anorexia diagnosis or that I've lived with anorexia and bulimia or something like that. Um, this kind of makes me wonder you know, was this person sometimes not eating, sometimes purging, which is still bad. Don't get me wrong. It's still bad. Um, and then just decided, aha, I have anorexia and bulimia. Uh, but for the doctor to respond, clearly that's not the extent of the problem. That's also a problem. Okay. I've had, I've had a doctor diagnose me with stuff and then make these comments after that. Um, you know, doctors are not always great. Okay. So the doctor's not great here, but I also wonder I also wonder about the patient as well. So we're going to go to the latest. Some of these are from old. Um, oh. Also, research shows that POC are more ho harmed by WS. Is that white, white supremacy? I don't know what WS is. Then white people because our privilege protects us to some extent. Okay. Came to treatment having never measured my food. I came out obsessively counting and calculating everything I ate because everybody needed to be accounted for. How is that okay? Oh my goodness. Okay. So 
this is another horrific example of diagnosis fat. No, this is an example of somebody unfortunately having an eating disorder that was undiagnosed and it became uh, made manifest through um, this experience, right? You're, you're born predisposed to an eating disorder or not. You're born genetically predisposed to depression or not. Genetically predisposed to schizophrenia or not. And then an environmental factor opens up that disorder. That's kind of that's how they that's how they, the mental illnesses kind of work. Um, in some cases, like schizophrenia, usually the environmental factor is like hormones that change during puberty. Um, but in this case, it looks like this person never had anything to trigger that eating disorder, and then it happened. This is not diagnosis fat. This is an unfortunate situation. A uh, co-worker passed away. She was a black woman in her early 30s. She went to the doctor about shortness of breath and chest pain. He just told her to lose weight. She had clots in her lungs and a massive heart attack Friday. So again, this is, you know, this doctor, you know, should have checked. Um, but I, I don't even know if I would necessarily say it was the fat that caused it. I mean, the fact that this was a, a black person and that person was also a woman. I mean, women are unfortunately... Um, we, we do not have like a percentage wise, um, more males have heart attacks, just the larger percentage of males do. And we talked about that with the testosterone and that's terrible, right? Because of that, a lot of the, um, studies on, on heart attacks have been done on males, right? and not on women. So with women versus men, there are different um, symptoms of heart attack. So there might be the pain shooting down the arm, like that kind of classic dramatic kind of thing. But for a lot of women, um, when they're having a heart attack, they'll feel a little tired. Uh, They'll feel short of breath. Their chest might hurt. They might have a headache. I mean, that's me feeling, I, every day I feel like that, honestly. So for me, if I were to have a, a heart attack, I would probably die too. Because I wouldn't even go to the hospital. I would just be like, oh, wow, extra bad chronic pain day to day. I guess I'll just take a break. And I'd just die in my sleep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, again, that's that's bad. I don't know if that's a diagnosis fat thing. I, I still would say this is just tragic. Um, but I, I would say this is not diagnosis fat this is diagnosis fat black woman unfortunately yeah um and that's you know part of the problem with this again with some of these doctors you know not being good is that it 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 makes people think uh therefore every case of this diagnosis fat thing is genuine so there was one of them where it was something about uh, a person who was transgender, but the doctor had refused to prescribe them hormone replacement therapy um, until they lost weight. And so they said, this is diagnosis fat. And just out of curiosity, I looked it up and apparently beyond a, a weight, like 170 pounds or something, um, the, the hormones were ineffective. Like they were weight dependent. And the person was overweight for the medication. So the doctor was like, if you want this medication, I'm happy to prescribe it, but I need you to get under this weight. And maybe did or didn't tell the patient because this is a weight dependent hormone. If you're overweight over this weight limit, you're, the medication doesn't work. It's kind of like when um, some doctors won't perform surgery on an obese patient because the amount of, um, what is it, the, the anesthesia Um, The amount that's needed for their weight could kill them. That kind of thing. So that's what it was about. It appeared to be, oh, the doctor is fat shaming. They're saying that they expect trans people to look a certain way. And it it just wasn't that. It was that I'm happy to prescribe you the meds until, you know, but not until you lose the weight um, because the medication was weight dependent. And so that's, I think, where the problem comes in. Um, There are cases where cancer might not be diagnosed or a heart attack is missed but then there's other cases where they don't include the full story and that's also a problem 
you know because it, it it's 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 fine to talk negatively about doctors that are doing a poor job it is not fine to then say the entire medical profession has failed that's not okay um we'll show that i don't know why i hid that for you Let's see, I was eating half a kilo of celery every day, plus all the other food. Three kilos of food per day, my goodness. Have you been in one of the Korean mountains? The weather will be good soon. Plenty of good food waiting for you when you come down, that's true. Oh, I have. I have been to the mountains. I just, I, I tend to not, not go up on the mountains very much. Um, I mean, especially these days with the, with the virus, but... Physical exercise is better for me if I do it in a single area, like a gym or on an exercise bike or something like that, um, because sometimes I just need to stop. And unfortunately, when I'm on a, you know, I'm climbing or hiking up the side of a mountain, I might need to stop and sit, but then I have to come down the rest of the mountain. Um, so for me, it's it's, yeah, I've been, I mean, I've been on the mountains, and the path isn't very wide. That's part of the problem. So if I need to stop and sit down, I'm sitting on the, the dirt and blocking everybody's path. You know what I mean? I f just feel like, I don't know, I guess it's really discouraging for me, which is unfortunate because the mountains here are gorgeous. Um, and I, I love nature and I want to go out and hike. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's so, it's, I don't know, it's so discouraging. That's why I still did this, this live stream. Because uh, somebody was asking, why don't you just cancel it if you have a migraine? And I said, you know, it just I'm just so sick of migraines controlling my damn life. I'm just so sick of it. You know, it just sucks. Um, I think it's weight stigma. That's true, yeah, so in some cases. Um, let's see. My sister was supposed to get a breast reduction. They were telling her she has to lose weight first. Um, it's pretty standard stuff like that. For sure, you know, and especially with something like a breast reduction, especially if your sister was planning on losing weight and was very overweight, um, that's going to affect the, the quality of the breast reduction. And if she's willing to undergo the surgery now and then she loses a bunch of weight after, she's probably going to need to come back because her breasts are going to look you know, not, not even, or they're going to look awkward for her new size. Um, you know, and plus, I, I, I don't know how large she was, um, but for some people, yeah, they're, they're just, um, too large to safely have that many, um, uh, that amount of anesthesia. And then of course, if it's during the pandemic, you know, now you're recovering from surgery and you're obese so you're already at risk for, your, for you know, a slower uh, recovery. Your immune system's already compromised. And you're, now you're in a hospital, you might be exposed to um, the SARS coronavirus, uh, the two. You know, this is, this is just too much, right? It's like, if you want to do it now, you got to lose weight. Um, otherwise, come back, you know, two years later or something like that. Um, my friends keep sending me pictures on the top of the mountains. Of course, my female friends keep sending me pictures of the flowers they take care of. Well, that's good. I should take care of flowers. We're going to try to make an herb garden at the school. Um, unfortunate circumstances can lead to unfortunate diagnoses, and that leaves some with unfortunate outcomes. Right, and we need to differentiate. And I think that's the other part of the problem for diagnosis fat is that, as this hashtag, um, there w we need to call out the bad doctors that are doing this but we also cannot ignore the harm and complications that obesity provide and i feel like diagnosis fat is trying to not shame the bad doctors but to shame all the doctors and also to ignore any effect that obesity plays um and so i feel like it's like it's trying to raise awareness but i feel like it's really really doing a disservice yeah, it's unfortunate because I, I don't think that these people are doing it out of spite or because they're stupid or anything like that. I, I think they they really believe they're they're doing something important and raising awareness um, in hopes that other people can avoid similar problems that they've gone through. But but no, none of the root issues are actually being tackled. 
and that's that's why I think it's so so hard yeah um let's see also the sagging stretching weakened tissue makes the healing hard and the scarring worse absolutely absolutely all of those things are true um you know the doctor wants to give you the best i would say a good like a good surgeon is going to ask you to do that they want to give you the best chance at recovery with the they, they don't i mean you can you can say yeah i'll sign a waiver and stuff and then if i die it's my fault but that's going to haunt your surgeon that they're going to say, you know, I, I knew I shouldn't have let her come in. I knew I shouldn't have done this. And now they're dead. It's my fault. You know, doctors have a high suicide rate as a job. I mean, they, they have to understand that too, that they, they want to have good before and after pictures. So that way future patients can see the before and after pictures and feel confident about the procedure. Um, you know, this doc, that's this doctor's work. And if the doctor like does it, and then your sister gets sick or she loses weight and then they look really wonky after that. And then she's going to, somebody's going to say, yeah, I was thinking about getting a breast reduction. Your sister's going to say, well, don't go to Dr. So-and-so because I went to Dr. So-and-so and he totally botched my reduction. You know, that's what's going to happen. And so the doctor's trying to, you know, protect their reputation, uh, protect the patient. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's like you cannot fault the doctor for wanting the best outcome for you because your good outcome is good for you but also good for them you know what i mean um so i i would be wary of a doctor that's willing to do it for sure yeah i would be wary of a doctor that's that's willing to do something like that um yeah unless i mean unless you've talked i don't know I, I would say there's there's probably some exceptions to that but yeah all right um yeah, Sugal, thanks for, for joining us. Thanks for contributing. Same with everybody else, um, you know, for joining us. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to have to, to end this. Um, last question here was, have you tried acupuncture, another treatment in Korean? Um, I have tried... Uh, what did I try? I've tried um, osteopathy in Korea. Um, I have tried... Uh, I was part of an acupuncture medical study, actually, um, for a uh, medical university when I was in the United States. Uh, they said that, unfortunately, it works for about 50% of the patients, and I just happened to be in the 50% it didn't work for, which was too bad. Um, they gave me... So, of course, you don't know if you're in the placebo or the real group. Um, and so after, you know, every time after I was receiving the treatment... You know, it was, I don't, it just, I felt worse. And they asked me, you know, they, they did these, um, like they checked for the, they did like a different, like objective pain measure. It wasn't just asking me how I felt, um, but they did a different one as well. It was this, um, thumb screw thing. I, I oof, don't recommend it. They're painful. And they were like, okay, so which one do you think? You think you were in the acupuncture group or the placebo group? And I'm like, nope, I, I know how these studies go. Like, I don't, I didn't want to think about anything. I didn't want to form anything. I did not want the placebo effect. And they said, well, which one do you think? And I said, I would hope that I was in the placebo group because I really want this to, to be something to work for me. And I felt worse every time I came here. And they said, yeah, unfortunately, you were in the, the acupuncture group. So I asked them, you know, what, what the, the results were showing. They're like, yeah, it seems to just confirm the, the 50%. Um, unfortunately, it was not in the 50% that it helped. Um, yeah, but I've, I've seen, I mean, I've seen a lot of other treatments. Um, I'm trying to think of, of anything else specifically in Korea other than, you know, people giving me different kinds of teas or those um what is it the the hanyak uh the korean traditional medication um you know some of it is 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 helpful um and stuff for for stuff like uh certain sicknesses and things you know um but nothing for, for like migraines or chronic pain unfortunately um which which is too bad you know what i mean it's too bad but yeah. Uh, you know, I do take things like ginger, turmeric, magnesium, you know, I take those things every day. Um, you know, so it's not just, it's not just prescription medication I'm on. 
um you know and i'm open to it but unfortunately that's that's just haven't found any anything that's been really really helpful just eat well and try to enjoy your life yeah that's that's pretty much what i'm what i've been trying to do you know can't fix it so may as well right if i'm gonna have a migraine anyway and i'm able to sit up i don't may as well have a have a group stream like this you know i enjoy doing these i know that some of you guys enjoy it as well um you know that's just kind of how i see it so just do what we can and you know uh there's certain things that are out of my control but not everything is out of my control try to fix what is in my control and you know accept the rest <laughs> that's kind of how i see it all right y'all thank you for joining me today hopefully this was helpful um if, if anybody else has any lingering questions or anything please put it in the comment section and then i'll be able to answer you okay um oh good i'm glad to hear that nick um when you mentioned during a migraine how you understood why people in the middle ages would drill a head or drill a hole in their head for relief from migraines really felt sad for you not in a patronizing way yeah no i i definitely get it and i I'm for, i had a really bad four day long migraine once i mean i've had you know four or five six day long migraines but this one had been especially bad and i just remember having a very lucid like thought like this is your life now you should just just jump off the the building or something and it scared me because like, that's not how i want to think like, you know that's not what i want you know so just like just this idea like that's it you better just jump off you know um but yeah that's uh but when when I had that thought, and again, it's not like I I I feel that way, you know. It's not like I, I I'm gonna act on that or anything. Um, it was just such a just like a thought to have waking up. Um, it reminded me of how most people treat cluster headaches, which are worse than migraines. Most people treat cluster headaches with suicide, and I was just like, wow, I I can't blame them. I just can't, you know. Which is sad. It's sad that your body can malfunction in such a way. That life, that that living is 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 not life, and the the only viable option for you to achieve any kind of relief is to end your existence. It's it's really, really sad. All right, so see you guys later. Have a good one. Adios. Bye bye. Alrighty.